Oh, apologies. Agenda item one is the declaration of interests of our new member, and I welcome Jenny Gilruth to the Justice Committee and invite Jenny to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, for the record, uh, I'd like to declare that I'm the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Education. Thank you for that. Agenda item number two is the decision on taking item six in private, which is consideration of witnesses for stage one scrutiny of the management of offenders bill. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Um, agenda item number three is our closing evidence session on remand. And I refer members to paper one, which is note by the clerk and paper two, which is private paper, and I'm just going to give the officials a moment to settle and start by welcoming Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, Philip Lamont, Criminal Justice Division, and Kerry Morgan, Community Justice Division with the Scottish Government. And I understand you wish to make an opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just a brief comment. Uh, thank you for inviting me this morning to give evidence on remand. It has been interesting to hear the range of topics covered in the previous evidence sessions. Uh, it might be helpful to the committee if I briefly set out the Scottish Government's uh, position. Uh, bail decisions rightly are a matter for the courts and are made within the legal framework that this Parliament put in place back in 2007. However, I am keen to address issues relating to the inappropriate use of remand in Scotland by working together with partners and stakeholders to consider what can be done to reduce the use of remand where it is safe and appropriate to do so. I am committed to reducing use of short periods of custody, as demonstrated by our intention to extend the presumption against short prison sentences. And it's clear to me that remand is just as disruptive as short prison sentences. It impacts on families and communities and adversely affects employment opportunities and stable housing. The very things that evidence shows support desistance from offending. I believe that measures such as supported bail as an alternative to remand can have a greater role to play in supporting our vision for a safer, fairer and more inclusive Scotland. Where those involved with the criminal justice system can be supported to be active and responsible contributors to their communities. Crucially, such an approach can be taken while still ensuring public safety is appropriately maintained. And I hope this is helpful and of course I'm happy to answer any questions from members. Thank you. We now move to questions starting with Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, just to pick up, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, on uh, you talked about the presumption against short-term sentences and uh, suggested that the, the disadvantages that the Scottish Government has identified in short-term sentences may be shared by uh, those remanded. Uh, so, uh, just to clarify, do you think that the disadvantages of short prison sentence, sentences are shared by remand uh, and what can you just elaborate on what plans you have to reduce the use of remand so uh, do you mean that do I share the view that short term prison sentences uh, and remand cause disruption to people's lives and mm. that they end up affecting their employment potential their housing situation just in the way I made comment in my opening statement mm. well of course they do uh, they do have a similar disruptive effect. Um, uh, very often, the, I think the, the, the average time for someone who's in remand is something like 23 days uh, for a male, but 26 days for a, a female. For some, that could be a longer period of time. We know that uh, key factors in helping to support assistance from criminal activity is things such as housing, employment, family contact, uh, factors such that short-term prison sentences are uh, very often uh, it, it have a negative impact on, and there's no doubt that those who also receive demand, remand uh, can be impacted on those matters as well. So, uh, yes, there are similarities between the two of them. So what have we been doing uh, in relation to these matters? So uh, remand over the last 10 years is, um, uh, the use of remand is down by about a fifth. Uh, there's been a reduction of around 20% in its use uh, since 2008. 
eight. Um, uh, that uh, fits alongside the new provisions which were in the 2007 Act, uh, which reset the criteria and arrangements around the use of uh, remand and the presumption in favour of remand with, uh, with regards to the, the, the public, um, uh, 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 public safety issues that have to be taken into account uh, and exceptions which are within the legislation. Uh, we've put in provision to help to support the development of uh, bail su supervision programmes, uh, bail information services. Uh, we've provided additional resources specifically for uh, female-based programmes uh, so that they uh, can provide uh, specialist uh, bail supervision and uh, diversion programmes for women who may end up in the criminal justice system. So there's a range of factors which have contributed to the reduction in the use of remand. Um, but overall, uh, levels of remand are reflective of the, uh, uh, the significantly high prison population that we have as a country of our size compared to other comparable nations across Europe. Uh, members will be aware that Scotland has the second highest prison population in Western Europe, only exceeded by England and Wales. Uh, and our use of remand is broadly reflective um, of that high prison population, the vast majority of which are people serving short-term prison sentences. Um, <clears throat> and you said in your opening statement that the, that the bail decision would be a matter for the court. So what do you understand as being the main drivers between the current level of use of remand? I think um, for sentences, when they are taken into account whether they give someone, uh, uh, they, they hold someone on at uh, remand, there will, the likelihood is that there will be a variety of different factors that they will take into account. The legislation requires them to consider that. Mm -hmm. So there will be a variety of different factors which they will take into account. For many of the individuals which they are dealing with, uh, many of them will have uh, chaotic lifestyles. Uh, and, uh, and, they, uh, and on the basis of um, their presentation to court, they may already have uh, several bail orders already in place. Uh, there may be issues around their uh, likelihood to uh, appear in court, uh, etc. All the criteria has to be taken into account, including public safety matters. Um, and censors make that, that decision. Um, I was interested, when you, when you received evidence from Sheriff Liddell, uh, there is a perception that uh, if there were more services available, would that change censors' views? And if, if, I, if I hope I've interpreted his views correctly, is that that was only one factor that they would take into account, is what services are actually available. There's a whole range of factors that they take into account. So um, I don't think there is any single aspect uh, that you could say um, is driving our use of remand. It is ultimately a matter for sentences. There are issues around prosecution policy as well, uh, that cases are marked in the central hub, which are then determined by the deputy who is dealing with the case in court um, uh, as well, whether there's a variation from their views on what the case was marked at the time. Um, so I don't think there's a single factor. I think there's a variety of different things that come into play. And I suspect most sentences will take into account several different factors when they're making a determination on whether they should give someone remand or not. And just uh, briefly, if I may, the, you talked about the inappropriate use of remand uh, in your opening statement. Mm. Uh, by that, do you mean the sentencer has made the wrong... Or, Wrong, wrong's not the right word there. Uh, the sentencer has come to a decision which is not appropriate. Uh, or do you mean it's the appropriate uh, sanction, if you like, but uh, is the wrong thing for the individual? What, what did you mean by the inappropriate use? What, what, what I mean by that is um, where there are a reasonable uh, bail supervision programmes in place, uh, that could have been appropriately used is uh, trying to encourage sentencers to make sure they're aware of them and making appropriate use of them as well. Um, and uh, where there is bail uh, uh, information services in place, making sure that sentences are making as much use of those um, as well. Uh, is there more we can do to give uh, sentencers confidence around these matters? No doubt there is, um, uh, uh, which, which they may find helpful. We should always be prepared to, uh, to look at how we can improve the information which they have available uh, to them. Uh, but also, um, it's about uh, looking at um, aspects of how, so for example, um, 
with the, and I know you're going to be taking a, a briefing this later on, is there, uh, is there more we can do through the use of electronic monitoring uh, uh, in uh, addressing issues relating to bail as well? Uh, and I believe there is a potential scope for that in the future. So it's more about, um, it's not necessarily them making the wrong decisions, it's about making sure they're armed with all the necessary information that they require in making that decision. And that includes having information about bail supervision programmes and also bail information services that are available within the locality at the time when they're making those decisions. Thank you. Okay, Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, and, and, and again, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the starting point for this inquiry is that, you know, the, the stark figures, both are in terms of the, the proportion of the prison population which are, are there because of remand, and indeed, just had a briefing uh, or a submission from the, uh, the, 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 the Court and Tribunal Service, uh, which shows that under summary procedure, um, of those people who are remanded, 40% are then given a non-custodial sentence and need 12% uh, don't receive a sentence at all. So half uh, of people on remand who are going through the summary procedure are, are going into prison and ultimately that, that's not where they're destined, which is, a, I think, seems odd. Uh, yet one of our frustrations, I think, right the way through this is there's a, a lack of data as to why remand is being used. Is that a sort of a frustration you share? Do you think more could be done to centrally collate um, the, the, the reasons and purposes that, that, that remand is being used by the courts? Well, can I pick up on your first point, and mm. that about the, um, uh, the number of people who end up in remand that then uh, ultimately through, for example, summary proceedings that then receive a a custodial sentence. One of the uh, criteria that the short court should take consideration of at the time when making a determination on whether someone should be remanded or whether they should be bailed is the likelihood of them, uh, uh, the likelihood of them receiving a custodial sentence at the end of it. Uh, and that's been the criteria that's been in place since 2007-2008. Uh, so it is a matter which will be taken into account. I fully recognise, though, that there will be times when a sentencer will decide that a period in remand may be appropriate from a public safety point of view, it may be for witnesses, it may be for victims' purposes, that they believe it's appropriate, even though they, they recognise that given the nature of the offence, the likelihood of a custodial sentence is probably uh, remote. So I understand that I think it's important our, our courts have flexibility in being able to, uh, to make, and sentences have flexibility in being able to make those uh, particular uh, decisions. On your second point in relation to the uh, requirement for uh, or, uh, gathering more data, I'm, I'm always uh, very keen in making sure that we gather as much appropriate data as possible, so long as it serves a purpose. Uh, so as it stands at the present moment, um, our courts, when it comes to summary proceedings, um, uh, the court minute would normally uh, record whether uh, uh, whether someone's been granted bail or not, but not necessarily the reasons for it, although the the sheriff at the time or judge is likely to have set out uh, orally why uh, uh, bail has been granted or, or not. Um, I know that the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service um, uh, have said that there is, a, uh, there is a potential for gathering data. Um, uh, there are downsides to that in terms of the costs, etc., involved in it and some of the bureaucracy that may be associated with it. Um, but I would also want to be clear about whether gathering that data would help to improve things? Would it change things? Um, uh, and what purpose it would actually serve? So I think what I would say is that I'm always open to looking at whether, the, uh, whether there are uh, areas of data we could collect that would help to improve things, that would have a purpose and it wouldn't be unduly bureaucratic. Um, uh, but I think we need to consider this further as to see whether that would actually truly make much of a difference if the data was gathered. Well, I mean, perhaps if I could could submit the, 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 the two you know, possible purposes for those are, are one, to ensure that there's consistency, to ensure that, that essentially people are receiving broadly the same outcome from, from, from different courts. And the secondly, in terms of you're seeking to, to drive system-wide change, actually understanding you know, why particular outcomes are arrived at at a, at a system-wide level are useful. I mean, I, so I was wondering if, if you'd... Re re reflect those two broad points and without mm. that data it's very difficult to really establish either of, of those 
Well, uh, things. Well, on your latter point, I'm, I'm very open to hear what the committee's got to say in its report, having considered the evidence over, uh, I think, five sessions now you've had on on remand and, 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 and whether you believe that uh, uh, collation of further data would be helpful in, in, in understanding some of these aspects. Would it deliver greater consistency? I'm not sure it will, because the reality is that very often sentencers in making decisions around bail and remand is that they are very individualised. Uh, depending on the individual, the circumstances, their history, etc. So, um, uh, and I think it would be very difficult to create a, a data collection system that would allow us to have that direct comparison. I understand where you're coming from, mm -hmm. but I, I suspect there are just such variations in uh, cases appearing in court that um, uh, it would be very difficult to envisage a, a data collection system that would allow us to have that direct comparison between uh, cases. However, um, you know, I'm open to looking at whether there are, and given evidence that you've heard, where you do believe that um, some further data collection could assist in understanding what's going on in the use of remand. However, my note of caution in all of this is that um, it needs to be the collection of data that serves a purpose in improving how the system would operate. So uh, what we're trying to achieve from the collection of data and if what we're trying to achieve could improve how the system is operating, then let's look to see if we can develop a data collection system that would help to facilitate that particular improvement, rather than just collecting data for the sake of it. So, I mean, just moving on slightly, I mean, connected to data is, are the individual court records. And if I can make a bit of a distinction, I mean, to my mind, data is about the aggregate view, uh, you know, collating data at that system-wide level, whereas individual courts will have a, a record of each case. Now, you, you mentioned in a, in a, a previous answer that the, the sheriff would uh, will, will, will ordinarily give a, a reason why he's uh, granting bail or, or uh, putting someone on remand, but that that's not necessarily always recorded and certainly not always recorded in the same way. I mean, again, do you think, I mean, given both the seriousness and indeed I think kind of the the general concern that we should be trying to sort of minimise the, the use of remand, whether or not there, there's scope in terms of what, what is recorded, in particular, the, you know, the recording the reason that the sheriff gives when, when he is putting someone on remand rather than granting bail. Well, um, he or first, she, I should say. Sorry. Sure. The first thing would be is that um, uh, if it, if it's a, in in summary cases, uh, the the minute of the court would just record the basic detail, and that was whether you know, a remand was granted or not. Mm -hmm. If it was a solemn case, then everything is noted, so much more detail is, is held on these matters. I think it would be more a case of um, would, the, would the recording of the data start to drive change in the system? So, for example, we had um, I commissioned three uh, pilots in uh, uh, three different sheriffdoms. Uh, around two and a half years ago, uh, now using improvement methodology, looking at the use of remand and bail, a big part of which was about collecting data during the course of those particular exercises. One of the things it did show is just great variations in the use of remand from day to day, um, quite literally and from court to court, um, depending on what they were actually uh, hearing. Um, the, the, you know, if there is a, if there is a, if we were to create a, a statutory requirement for the, uh, for the, uh, for sheriffs and for the court to record exactly the reasons for not granting, uh, uh, not granting bail, um, uh, there's additional bureaucracy that goes with that. But notwithstanding that, I go back to the original point I was making: is that um, what is the purpose of actually doing that, and what? change will it drive in the system? So even if the, if the court minute writes down and it's got noted the reason that it was what was said orally in court, uh, why remand has not been granted, what purpose does that then serve uh, in affecting any change in the system and how remand is being used? So um, I think that's, my, that's the key, that would be the key factor in my mind in determining whether there should be any change to the data collection system. Uh, will it drive change and improvement and what improvement are we trying to achieve here? Uh, and although we collected a lot of data during the course of the three pilots we had in three different sheriffdoms, 
um, is that um, the data didn't give effect to changing practice. Um, uh, it just demonstrated there were marked variations taking place. Well, I, I suggest that if you can spot variations, that, that doesn't necessarily lead to changes in practice, but at least allow, allows you to identify uh, where change is potentially required. But I mean, I, I guess I'd, I'd also add, it's one other reason in that I think I'd suggest that when you are depriving someone of their, their liberty, that recording the, the reason why I, I would suggest is, is, is quite important. So, you know, the, the, the sort of the wider purposes in terms of this, you know, the, the system to one side, in terms of just the individual uh, case and the individual person, uh, you know, if you are depriving them of their liberty, being very clear and recording the, that clear reason why their, li their liberty is being deprived, I, I think is important in and of itself. I'm just wondering what your reflection on that point would be. I suppose we are, we are going into the territory of what's in a, a court minute, what's yeah. not in a court minute, and, 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 and I, I'd imagine that the Lord President uh, would have views on that, what would be appropriate in being recorded and what. As I say, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, uh, solemn matters, everything is recorded in these matters mm -hmm. uh, uh, within the court. All the details are recorded, uh, unlike in, in summary cases. Um, I... Uh, uh, I you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying about it. I'm, I'm, I'll be interested in hearing what the committee's views are, given the evidence that you've heard around uh, around data uh, and whether you uh, feel that additional data collection would be um, would be helpful. Um, uh, I'm not opposed to it. I just want to understand what purpose it will serve and what potential benefit could come from it. Uh, and then to make sure that the data, that any additional data that is going to be collected has a purpose to it uh, and, uh, and can help to inform uh, practice and improvement in the system. So um, uh, I'm very much open to looking at whether you know, additional data collection could assist and improve things. Um, but I'm very mindful of the fact that it should have a clear purpose to it and about uh, having effect on the system. Yeah. Um, Liam MacArthur, supplementary. Just very briefly, good morning. Um, I mean, morning. I, I take your point about um, the allocation of resources, and I think we've heard mm. um, uh, considerable evidence about where um, resources um, that, that do become available could be usefully spent, not necessarily in data collection. But I think following on from Daniel Johnson's line of questioning, notwithstanding the variability that I think you quite rightly point out, um, it would be a concern if it wasn't being captured, whether in an uh, individual court or across the piece, that consistently, as part of the, 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 um, uh, the unwillingness to, to grant bail, was a picture of the lack of availability of, of services, or the services that were available were not deemed to be effective enough, either because multiple um, uh, referrals to, to those services had, had not um, achieved the outcomes necessary. At least that information would allow some kind of policy response in terms of uh, addressing whatever shortcomings there is, either in the lack of the service uh, being available at all or in its effectiveness um, in, a, in a particular area. Would that not be a valuable um, uh, outcome to be derived from the sort of data gathering that, that Daniel Johnson's referring yeah, to? I think, I think potential, although I think it's important to keep in mind here is that the presumption is in favour of bail. And the use of um, uh, bail information services and bail supervision uh, programmes is uh, as an alternative to the person being remanded. So it shouldn't be that, um, uh, that someone who... Someone who would ordinarily receive bail, it should, and the court sees it being appropriate, then they should receive bail, irrespective as to what services are available. Um, where they're considering remand uh, for someone and that they believe that the services which are available provide a viable alternative to someone being remanded, uh, then, uh, uh, then it's important those services are known to the sheriff to be able to make a decision, or the judge to make a decision and determination at that particular uh, uh, point. So I think that's an important distinction uh, uh, to make um, around how the existing arrangements uh, operate. So, um, but I'm I'm open to the, the you know whether there is further data that could be collated. But I will re-emphasise this point about the need for it to have purpose. Uh, and what we're trying to achieve with it um, as well. And I, I do go back to the evidence that you receive from the Sheriff's Association. Very often, 
uh, reason, the reason for deciding not to, and I think you got this from the Edinburgh Bar Association as well, very often uh, chefs and judges in determining not to grant bail is that there'll be several factors uh, that will often lead to that, uh, rather than a single factor on its own. Um, and, uh, uh, and it may be that service provision is only one aspect that they would consider anyway uh, if they were determining these matters. If it's helpful, Cabinet Secretary, I think the, the lack of data just generally is a theme that's run through the Parliament in consecutive years from its, um, since its inception. So I think, you know, where possible, if it's not too burdensome, without trying to second guess the purpose of the data, if as much can be recorded as possible, because you never know in the future when there's an aspect that, that could be useful. I think that's generally how, um, how how I certainly would look at the, the emphasis in trying to record as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you did receive evidence from the Scottish Court Service who were saying that if there were additional measures put in place, it would have resource implications for them. Yeah. Not just financial resource, but also court time resource uh, yeah. as well. And um, our courts are very often under significant pressure. So uh, uh, that's why I'm very clear about uh, uh, I'm not necessarily a fan of just collecting data for the sake of it. Um, I'm, uh, I think it's better that if we are going to provide or request additional data to be collected, it should be clear about what the purpose is and what we're trying to achieve from the collection of that data, mm -hmm. uh, rather than creating undue bureaucracy and cost uh, and burden uh, that could otherwise be avoided. There's certainly the burden and the cost and the um, very cognizance of that. But you know, when you second guess what might be appropriate data, it sometimes eliminates things that suddenly jump out from data as, you know, are we having so many vulnerable people here? Um, is there a, a niche or a gap here, wherever? No, no, so, doubt, no, doubt, no doubt if I was to make a request for lots of data to be collected and then people start to say, this has created an undue bureaucracy that's causing delays in cases because we're having to collect all this data, people would say, you've created a bureaucracy, it's unnecessary. So I'm just saying is that when you go into collecting data, um, I think we should be mindful of the potential negative consequences that go alongside that, while at the same time be, uh, be clear about what we're trying to achieve from the data collection, so that we're not asking sheriffs to spend more time collecting data, or clerks of the courts to spend more time and resources dealing with matters, cases being delayed and court time being used up purely for the collection of data because people like to pour over the data, when actually it doesn't really have any effect in terms of improving how the system is operating. So I just think if we are, uh, if there's a view we should go down that route, it should have a purpose to it and potential, and open up the potential to improve it rather than just creating bureaucracy for the sake of it. I think we're agreed that a balance to be struck. There is a balance to be struck, but I'm not a fan of just collecting data for the sake of it because people like to collect data. So. <laughs> you care. I'd like to move us on, if we could, to the experience of remand, what actually happens uh, to people when they are remanded. Now, in 2013, the former Justice Committee reported on purposeful activities uh, being carried out in prisons and said that there was a, a lack of opportunity for remand prisoners to be participating in purposeful activities. So are you able to tell us, please, Cabinet Secretary, what's happened since then? Has there been an improvement? What opportunities are there now that there perhaps weren't five years ago? So the uh, purposeful activity uh, framework which was introduced by uh, the Scottish Prison Service was uh, a, a long-standing piece of work which they carried out in looking at um, how they could make sure that the range of programmes which are available within our prison service are much more effective and much more consistently available across the system uh, and targeted that, um, uh, uh, the appropriate prisoner group uh, as they, uh, that they can best serve. The challenge that you have with remand prisoners is the time frame for which they're actually in prison, uh, which is extremely difficult for them to engage in purposeful activity programmes as a result. Now, as I'm sure the committee would recognise, is that uh, the purposeful um, activity programmes and education programmes, etc., which the Scottish Prison Service operate, uh, are uh, prioritised and being targeted at those who are convicted prisoners. Uh, uh, because they have a fixed timeline in which they can then engage with these individuals and work with them. Uh, for remand prisoners, they very often they don't have that. So the reality is that um, uh, the opportunity to uh, undertake work with someone who's unconvicted in prison for a very short period of time, uh, and at that stage it could actually be an undefined period of time as well, 
uh, depending on what progress is made uh, with their particular case. For the prison service to be able to deploy significant resource to be able to provide them with um, additional uh, input. Uh, the reality is that my, my personal view that, and, uh, is that uh, for the prison service to be able to affect much change in someone in such a short period of time is just wholly unrealistic. Um, for many of them, uh, they will come in, go through the same process as a convicted prisoner, being assessed, um, uh, uh, both in, in general terms, medically as well. Uh, they will have the opportunity to participate in education programmes uh, 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 where there's availability uh, for them. Uh, but uh, the, uh, for many cases, it will be a case of stabilising them. Um, many of these are individuals that will be coming in with a chaotic lifestyle, uh, potentially a significant drug problem uh, that the uh, prison service will need to prioritise to, uh, to manage. Um, uh, and any uh, medium to long term work uh, uh, that you would expect through purposeful activity programmes is, is very limited in what you can do with someone in remand. So um, uh, they do have uh, the opportunity to participate in programmes, although priority is given to convicted prisoners. Uh, but I do also think it's highly unrealistic to expect the prison <coughs> service to have much effect on someone. Uh, in changing them, uh, given a very limited period of time that someone may be in remand for. Uh, and the fact that very often the prison service won't have a defined period of time as to knowing how long that person is going to be with them in remand. I understand the point you make, uh, but can you tell me, would it be available? Let's say, uh, so, so I am now remanded uh, for an undefined period of time. Uh, and I want to engage in purposeful activity. Will that be available to me? or? Uh, because of the, the pressures that you've identified, I wouldn't be able to positively engage. In if there's availability, yeah, they are entitled to be able to participate in education programmes. And will um, that availability be there, as far as you're aware? Priority, priority will be given to convicted prisoners. So, uh, and uh, that continues to be the case, uh, because they're there for a defined period of time and they are, uh, have been assessed, uh, engaged in programmes in order to address their offending behaviour. Uh, remand prisoners are unconvicted prisoners. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you've already heard from one of your, uh, from Daniel Johnson, one of your own colleagues, is that uh, some 40 per cent of them uh, uh, will uh, not end up getting a, 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 a criminal, uh, sorry, a, a, a custodial sentence. So, um, uh, so no priority is given to convicted prisoners. Um, uh, and I believe that's the right thing to do, uh, given that these are individuals who have been convicted, uh, are there for a defined period of time, uh, and it's about addressing their offending behaviour. Um, where there's additional capacity, where there is scope to provide uh, uh, opportunities for uh, uh, unconvicted prisoners uh, or unconvicted individuals who are in prison, um, that they can participate in programmes. Thank you. That supplementary, Mary? Well, thank you, Convener. It was really just a follow-on directly from Liam Kerr's question, but in relation to young people, I visited a uh, Rossi school uh, just outside Montrose recently, which is a residential secure facility for young people, where they talked about uh, young people being put on remand, but obviously the adverse impact that that can have on them, say, if they're in a prison environment as opposed to an educational environment where they feel that they could have, they're better, better able to work with young people and have a more positive impact on them during their time in remand than being... Uh, than obviously being in a prison environment and the adverse impact that that can have on a young person's life. I was just wondering, is that something that, that is being looked at at all or is that something that, that can be looked at in terms of where we put young people when they are placed on remand? Well, look, I think the way to deal with young people is to try and prevent them from getting engaged in the criminal justice yeah. system in the first place. And their whole system approach is probably to be very effective in doing that. We have saw the number of young people who end up in custody as a result uh, being reduced significantly. Um, uh, which has also meant that the number of young people who end up uh, in remand uh, been reduced significantly, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's the approach we're continuing to take. So my, my view is that if, uh, if we are to uh, affect change, and uh, uh, particularly around uh, young people who are coming into contact with our criminal justice system, it's about prevention uh, as well. If... if, if, if um, uh, it, 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 the arrangements in, in, in somewhere like Pullman Young Offenders Institution are somewhat different from their adult prisons in terms of the range of services which are available uh, uh, for, uh, for young people who may uh, be remanded uh, there. 
Again, uh, I agree if there is a, an opportunity for them to be in another setting, uh, rather than somewhere like Pullman, uh, that would be more appropriate for them, then that's, that's the approach that we should take. Um, and that has been the approach we've been taking through our youth justice strategy, uh, which has had this significant impact on the number of young people who end up in uh, custody. But my, uh, I think the way we should look at this is about trying to prevent them from getting into that setting in the first place. Um, uh, and, to, and to work hard to achieve that uh, and to have our resources targeted at helping to reduce the need for young people to end up in, uh, in custody through remand or any other means. Uh, uh, but when they do end up and uh, need to go into remand, there is the opportunity to look at other settings as and when that's appropriate for that young person's needs and also given just safety issues and circumstances. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Um, you, you spoke earlier about the negative effects that uh, remand can have on prisoners and their families, and the Chief Inspector of Prisons agrees with that. Community Justice Scotland talks about the stress caused in relationships and the impact on housing and um, employment, uh, etc. Can you maybe outline what the government is doing to mitigate those negative effects? Well, there's um, one of the... Um, uh, well, part of that is to try and help to make sure we're getting the balance and the use of remand uh, right. And some of the measures that I mentioned earlier on, the bail supervision uh, programmes, the bail information service, the um, uh, shine mentoring programme, the uh, 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 roots programme we've got for males as well, are all about trying to help to support people in moving on or to prevent them uh, from getting remand as well. Um, one of the uh, important elements around uh, individuals who are in remand uh, is to try and help to make sure we maintain family links. Uh, so we're now in a position where we have a, a living of our prison establishments, have a, a family centre uh, provision. Uh, there were four uh, introduced in the course of the last year. Um, there's a further one going to be introduced this year, uh, which will take us up to uh, 12 over 15 establishments. Uh, and we are providing funding support for them. And the purpose behind them is to provide an environment that allows the helps to maintain and support family links uh, and to give some support and advice to the families as well. Uh, well, someone's either in prison or well, they're on remand. Um, someone who's on remand obviously has different visiting rights uh, from a convicted prisoner, so uh, remand prisoners are entitled to uh, daily visits um, and the visitor centres can be a, a much more helpful environment to help to support families if they are visiting prison on a, uh, such a frequent basis and if there's children involved as uh, well. It's also worth keeping in mind is that we know that uh, uh, a period in custody for a parent is a recognised uh, adverse childhood uh, experience, an ACE, uh, that we know can have a, a, a negative impact on a, a child's development and, uh, uh, and their development in future years. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to help to support the needs of families and children who may be affected by uh, parental imprisonment, whether that be due to remand or whether it be a prison sentence and the, the work that we uh, do through the family centres is targeted at trying to help to address those issues. Um, uh, the other aspects, whether it be housing, etc., we've now got the sure, uh, the SURE guidelines in place, which is about helping to ensure that people get housing uh, if they come out of remand or whether they uh, have sent, uh, it's been a period in prison. Uh, the work we do through um, or through care officers, and I would very much encourage you to consider the report the, uh, that was carried out into the effectiveness of uh, through care officers, which I think has been transformational. The way in which the prison service go about supporting people when they move out of prison, and sometimes that will involve working with individuals where it's appropriate who have been remanded as well, uh, and supporting them for uh, two to three months once they move into the community uh, through the prison service. So there's a range of different factors we'll put in place to try and help to address some of these, uh, these issues. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, collectively, I think they can help to address some of these matters. However, uh, there is always going to be a level of damage that's caused by someone when they are, uh, uh, when they are in prison, whether it be for remand or uh, uh, if they have been uh, convicted. Um, what we need to do is to try to help to make sure that we do as much as possible to address some of the consequences that come from that, but also helping to maximise the potential for when they go back into the community to minimise the risk of them coming back into prison and to maximise the opportunity for them to become uh, productive contributors to their society. So that's a, a, a short 
you know, a shortened version of some of the measures that we've put in place to try and address some of the issues that you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was aware of the support systems available, but I just wasn't sure if they were available to those in remand. So thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Okay, you. George. Thank you, Convener. Good, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. I'd uh, like to ask a question. In a number of sessions, we heard the fact that uh, there was information delays getting uh, for data, for medical data that was maybe coming to prisoners that were in remand, uh, people who maybe had an alcoholic, uh, were an alcoholic or a drug user, chaotic lifestyles, or even someone that's got asthma and heart condition. You know, basically they were presenting themselves to prison but the data wasn't following them, their actual medical records. Are you confident that the, uh, the NHS and the prison services are working together to try and sort this issue? Because that seems pretty basic and not beyond uh, the kind of sense to be able to actually take that information to them. Well, it's worth keeping in mind that back in, um, back in 2011, we made the decision to transfer uh, health and medical services within our prison service uh, to the NHS in order to help to improve that flow of data. Prior to that period, we had our, it was a, it was a Scottish prison service that was responsible for providing health and medical services within the prison estate. And one of the real challenges that came about from that was that transfer of information and data, not just into prison, but also back out of prison. So by transferring it to the, uh, the NHS, it was about helping to make sure that flow was actually addressed. So I do believe that that has improved significantly. Other aspects that could probably improve further, I suspect there are. Um, and it may be some of the evidence which you've heard um, it would demonstrate the need for that to be taken forward. So one of the areas of work that we are taking forward in government, um, uh, and it's my health minister calls that are taking this forward, is off the back of the, uh, the health committee's report and looking at healthcare provision within the prison estate and some of the measures that need to be taken forward to improve the consistency of the way in which uh, health care has been provided. It would be fair to say some health boards are better than others. So, for example, my own health board, uh, my own health board has three prisons that it has to cover. Um, it's got Pullman Young Offenders, it's got Compton Vale, and it's got Gunoko, uh, NHS Fourth Valley. Uh, uh, and uh, by and large, they deliver a very good service and are very attuned to working in close partnership uh, with the Scottish Prison Service. Um, there are other parts of the country where I think we need to refine that and make it work uh, better. So I think there are aspects where we can further improve it. And the work that my colleagues and uh, 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 health ministers are taking forward is about trying to help to improve how that can happen. What we've also done is we've also created the, uh, the, the Joint uh, Health and Justice uh, Improvement uh, Collaboration Board, which is headed up by the Director General for Health and the Director General for Justice um, uh, has a range of different parties on it, including the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, Chief Executives from the NHS, looking at targeted measures that they can take forward across our justice system, but that includes our prison service, and improving how we're getting uh, the flow of data and also those partnerships right, mm -hmm. and making sure people receive the right service. Uh, by and large, though, when someone is, uh, goes into prison, they will have that being screened by a nurse, mm -hmm. uh, uh, provision of a uh, very often uh, to see a doctor within 24 hours if that's necessary, uh, having been screened by a nurse. Uh, there'll be a consistency in how those services are being delivered. And, and I think there was some anecdotal suggestion in your evidence around whether people were getting access to their medication at the mm -hmm. right times as well. And um, uh, uh, I would always, my only note of caution on that is that is, is there hard evidence to demonstrate that is the case? And if there is hard evidence to demonstrate that is the case, and there's no doubt that both the NHS, whichever board that's responsible for it, uh, whichever uh, uh, prison this referred to, is to address that issue and mm -hmm. to sort it out. Um, although uh, my understanding is from the Scottish Prison Services that they weren't aware um, of a particular concern being raised with them, but uh, they're open to address it if there's evidence that there are particular establishments where there are problems. So uh, what I'm... Uh, what I would say is that those partnerships are stronger now than they've ever been as a result of the NHS now delivering uh, prison service health care. Uh, there are some health boards who are doing it better than others and others that need to improve further. Uh, the work that's been taken forward by my health calls is about helping to improve that uh, and the work that we're taking forward in the Health and Justice uh, Improvement Collaboration Board is about helping to make sure at a strategic level there's much clearer direction in addressing some of these issues. But where there are individual concerns, these are issues that both the 
prison service and the NHS locally uh, should be able to address readily as and when they are raised with them. Just to follow on from what you've said, obviously some of the evidence we've received as well is that people aren't necessarily getting sent to a prison that's quite local to them as well. Mm. So not only have you get the distance, the difference in the, their medical records going with them, you also have the issue that there's a distance as well. But one of the other points is I asked Colin McConnell uh, of the Scottish Prison Service uh, whether he believed the information sharing was a data protection problem or a process problem. And his answer was, I think it's about all of that. There are information sharing blockages that are related to particular uh, permissions that are not allowed to be given across organisations without the individual giving their say. So without doubt, there is a system and a process issue that simply get in the way because systems are incompatible. incompatible. That is not beyond us to resolve, but it's a huge challenge for us. Now, he's, he's, he's backed up what you've said there, Cabinet Secretary, as well, but the whole process, we still have this issue where there seems to be multiple uh, various, uh, we talk about a national health service, but within the various boards, there tends to be different IT systems, and it seems to be basic things like that, and I know IT is never basic, but it's basically uh, informational. That is the kind of key. Surely there's some way, in your opinion, how do you think we can actually overcome what seems to be a technical aspect, if not a challenging one? Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not an IT expert in terms of the technical uh, fixes in these things, which I think is often the term that's used by, uh, by IT experts, the, what the fix should actually be. What I can tell in terms of policy, well, just to give you an example, Pre-2011, mm -hmm. the challenge you had was that you had uh, Scottish Prison Service nurses and medical staff who would have difficulty in being able to access the NHS medical data from a data protection point of view. What you now have is you have NHS staff working within the prison estate so they can access the NHS information uh, as they require. Part of the challenge will be is having some of the um, uh, having systems within the Scottish Prison Service computer system that gives them access to that NHS uh, data. So some of the um, some of these uh, uh, wider data issues are matters that uh, are, are being considered by the uh, Health and Justice uh, Collaboration Improvement Board. That strategic work that needs to be taken forward, so that we are looking at where there are. Uh, barriers, blockages, uh, whatever it may be, if it's an IT solution, uh, is there a much more strategic approach that we can take to this? So what I prefer to avoid doing is that, uh, is that uh, each of our prison service establishments that are in different health board areas all have to have different fixes to be able to actually access the appropriate NHS information and the transferring of that information. Um, it would be good to do once for Scotland, and that would be for the Scottish Prison Service and having a, a system that allows, uh, as and when it's necessary within a prison establishment, no matter where it is in the country, to be able to access the appropriate medical records. But uh, that would be my view from a justice perspective. I'm conscious even within the NHS there are aspects between different health yeah. boards and being able to access and share information as well. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I don't, I wouldn't kid myself on that that's an easy thing to, to resolve. But that's why we have brought together this new uh, body, which has uh, uh, some of the key leaders uh, within both the justice and also the, uh, the health setting to deal with some of the more strategic issues. And part of that is about IT and data sharing uh, and appropriate protocols being in place and systems in place that can help to facilitate that more readily. OK, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Supplementaries, um, starting with Daniel, Mary and then Jenny. Thank you. So just following on from George Adams' uh, line of, of questioning, I mean, you, you, you're quite correct. The evidence we heard about the, the delays were anecdotal, but they were coming from people with a, a wealth of experience and mm. indeed were repeated when the committee uh, had a visit last week with, with Circle, who've got a fantastic track record. And what, what they were telling us was that people are often waiting weeks, if not months, to see a doctor, which, I mean, to my mind, sounds wholly unacceptable. I was just wondering if you would share that, if that is the case, we'd share that point of view that it would be unacceptable for people, someone to wait weeks, if not months, to see a doctor if they're in prison. Well, it depends for what purpose it is. Uh, so, for example, it could be, for example, someone in the community um, who requires to see a doctor for a particular specialist purpose, that there can be a waiting period for them to see someone. I'm, I'm not sure, is it, are these individuals who are just not seeing a doctor full stop? Or is it uh, that they're being referred to see a particular clinician for a, a specific purpose? So when we were discussing this with Circle, um, I mean, I think there was broad agreement that 
that this was just a generalised problem. So, but but also we were talking specifically around uh, addictions in, in particular. Um, so. Um, I, I don't, well, if, if it was to see, for example, a GP or to see a clinician, if they were waiting weeks for the purpose of actually seeing uh, someone for a basic medical appointment, I would have concerns about it. It may be that for some specific service, so it may be that a referral is going to be made into spe specific specialist services such as addiction services, mm -hmm. um, is that it, they'll be meeting the demands coming from within the community as well. So... And for individuals in the community, there may also be a waiting period in order to see one, someone. I'm just trying to, yeah, I'm, ju I'm just I, trying to, I, you know, I, I, I understand. I, 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 you know, I'm not, uh, it's, it's trying to understand whether it's about basic uh, healthcare issues uh, and seeing someone like a GP uh, or whether it is someone being referred down to a specialist service. And there's actually just demands for that service within that health board area that there is a waiting time to see uh, a clinician from that specialism. Uh, not because they're in prison, but just because of general demand on that service. I, I quite understand that you can't react to the specifics. I think I'm, I was just really just trying to share kind of our uh, mm. uh, slight shock <laughs> by that report. And can I just follow on? One, the other sort of shocking thing from last week, certainly from my perspective, was there was reported that if someone self-reports with an addiction problem without a prior prescription or prior uh, diagnosis, that they, are, uh, that they, they will only be... Um, re referred um, if they have uh, three positive drugs tests within prison. This is what uh, we were being told by, by Circle. But the implication being that the only way that, that that would be possible is if they were procuring drugs illegally within prison. Now that strikes again me as being uh, highly, well, a very worrying s situation. And indeed anyone reporting uh, self-reporting as having an addiction problem, at, at the very least that's drug-seeking uh, behaviour and would be a worry in and of itself, e even if they were not, not correctly reporting the situation. Is that a report that you would want to follow up on and would that concern you if that was the case? I think I think I need to get a better understanding of this. Is this, is this a, a problem that's been peculiar to CERCO? This is certainly something that they were reporting and the, and the, the, the practitioners that were there who were just discussing it, they, they were all in broad agreement that that was a, no one, this wasn't what one particular individual and, and mm -hmm. everybody else reacting in shock. This, this seemed to be a kind of a, a well understood situation and problem and it, it may well be worth um, the, the, following the, up with them directly but, but that just, was what just, was, just when you was reported. The, um, the charity. Oh, Circle. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. yes. No, I you said Circle. circle. You were no, saying no, Circle. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> sorry. The charity right. rather than the. Oh, yes. sorry. Right. Okay. Uh, circle. Uh, sorry. Um, I've, mis I've misheard you. Uh, apologies for that. Um, uh, I I'm happy for us to, to look at that. I think we just need to understand exactly what that is. It sounds to me if there is a requirement for three positive tests, there is some protocol of some sort in place. I don't know what the history of that protocol is and why it was put in place. It may be there is good reason for it being in place, but until I know about that and have an understanding of that, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I'm more than happy for that to be an issue we can take, take away and uh, uh, to try and identify what the issues are. Um, uh, and if uh, Circle, I think, a third sector organisation, yes. uh, if there's an issue about um, some of the experiences they're having that we can pick up on. Uh, and have those uh, to see if those can be addressed. But it sounds to me as though there may be a system in place that may be having some unintended consequences. Uh, but before committing to saying, well, that should end or it should change, you need to understand what the rationale and the reasoning behind that is. But we can, I can certainly take that away and, and we can look into that matter. I think that would be extremely helpful. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Mary, your aspect's been covered. So, yeah, Jenny. Mm -hmm. right, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to the panel. Good. Um, we know that we, we lock up more women in Scotland than any other part of the UK. So I want to focus on women's experiences of bail. Um, the committee has taken evidence from Communities Justice Scotland previously and were told that provision of services was patchy, with a witness stating that I worry for women in rural areas. The position is great for those who live in town centres where there are probably enough people to justify having a service. Now, in a letter to the committee earlier this year, um, the government has committed £1.5 million pounds to local authorities to improve bail support services for women. So I suppose this goes back to one of the, the questions we, we spoke about at the beginning of today's session, which is the purpose of data. How is the government monitoring local authority spend of that fund to ensure there is national parity in terms of services offered to women? 
Well, the uh, way in which resources are deployed for the purpose of delivering uh, bail and bail supervision, bail information services is through the um, uh, Criminal Justice Social Work funding, uh, which is around £100 million a year. It's ring fence money. It's then down to those individual local authorities then to determine what services they deliver within their area. Uh, what we don't do is we don't ring fence within the Criminal Justice Social Work budget mm -hmm. an element you have to deploy for the purposes yeah. of... Uh, a, a bail services. It's then determined by a local authority. What is ring fenced is the £1.5 million which we provide for the purposes of these programmes that are uh, provided uh, for targeting at female, uh, um, uh, uh, female offenders. They report back to us um, on an annual basis uh, on the delivery of those services uh, and the services which they are and the way in which they are using those resources. So if it would be helpful, uh, uh, we can provide you with some further information yeah. on uh, the way in which that's been taken forward. Um, some of them are targeted at uh, uh, reducing the risk of people actually ending up in the criminal justice system. Uh, some are targeted at helping to reduce uh, the uh, requirement for remand um, as an alternative uh, to remand. So we haven't prescribed how the it should go about it. We've allowed them uh, the scope to be able to determine what they believe is appropriate in their circumstances. But the additional money which we do provide for the purposes of uh, female-based programmes is a ring-fenced element. Mm -hmm. That comes off the back of a, um, a, a change fund uh, which we set up back in 2015. Uh, uh, and uh, we provided funding for it. It came to an end, but we continued with the funding specifically for... Uh, female-based uh, programmes. Uh, and that's distributed across the country uh, via uh, a formula which is agreed by the local authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's then for them to determine how they use that at a localised level. But they do report back to us on that matter. And uh, we can draw together some information and share that with the committee if that would be useful. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask a further question, Convener, going back to Rona Mackay's point um, with regard to young people. Um, because it's not always because a young person's uh, become involved in the justice system uh, that they have experience of it. Obviously, if their parent is in the justice system, then they will have direct experience of that, as you've already alluded to, Cabinet Secretary. So David Strang has previously told the committee that many women face additional, more complex needs, such as child custody issues. And Social Work Scotland told the committee that people will not always tell children the truth about what has happened, but children will know that something is not quite right. I was really interested, Cabinet Secretary, when you spoke about your work, uh, the government's work more broadly on additional uh, adverse childhood experiences, rather. Um, I wonder to what extent, then, you're working directly with the Cabinet Secretary for Education in terms of joining up uh, the work of the, the Justice Department and the work of education on tackling adverse childhood experiences uh, in this respect. Well, look, that's um, uh, uh, it's a really <coughs> important issue because it's an area where we've now got, I believe, uh, in government a much more uh, extensive level of engagement that's taking place across portfolios in order to address these issues. You only have to look at a programme for a government document where there is a specific section in, in it uh, around adverse childhood experiences and a range of different measures that were taken forward across portfolios, whether it be in education, justice, uh, 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 health, uh, in order to address these uh, issues. And we recently had uh, the Deputy First Minister recently hosted an event in Glasgow, Bell Houston Academy, uh, where uh, there were stakeholders uh, from across justice, health and, uh, and education, uh, including ministers, uh, uh, specifically looking at a range of different policy measures that can be taken forward to address issues around uh, ACEs. So, for example, uh, the work that we're doing around uh, uh, the interrupt but we're slightly off subject a little bit and we're going on for an hour so if yeah okay. <laughs> you can continue but be mindful of the time well I'm just conscious that remand is a, a, a recognized appeal in custody is a recognized yeah. Yeah. but just to say that one of the things that uh, would you call it that um uh, we're doing in order to address try to address some of these issues is uh, for example is through the uh, the family centers uh, mm -hmm. at our uh, prison establishments to help to provide support to families and uh, uh, that may be <coughs> affected by imprisonment to make sure we're providing a greater level of support and resource to these individuals and the children in particular. Uh, and the expansion we've had over the last year as a reflection of us recognising the real need to make sure that we maintain those family links to address some of the underlying causes that can uh, then result in adverse childhood events for children. So, um, uh, uh, so I hope that's a practical policy illustration, but there's absolutely no doubt from a governmental point of view at a strategic level 
and looking to try and join up the dots around that particular area mm -hmm. uh, to minimise the damage it's caused to children who experience custody. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. Uh, thank you, Karina. Um, Cameron Secretary, good morning. And panel, good morning. Good morning. Um, the 2008 report from the Scottish Prisons Commission stated that often remands are the result of lack of information or lack of services in the community to support people on bail. Have things changed very much since 2008 till now? Yeah, they have. So the range of bail supervision services which are available and also bail information services which are available have increased. And, for example, just the uh, 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 comments of making around the provision of resource for female-specific programmes as well mm -hmm. um, has in, increased. And I think that's reflected by the fact that there has been a, um, a, a reduction of some 20% in the use of remand um, over that period of time since 2008. So... Uh, uh, having said that, is there more we need to do? Of course, and it'll be interesting to hear what the committee's got to say and what, they, what you believe are the areas that we need to make further progress on. Um, uh, but yes, uh, there have been improvements, progress has been made, but there's no doubt more we could do uh, and we should do. And hopefully your committee report will help in uh, identifying some of the areas where further progress can be made. Good, thank you. Okay. John Finney. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner. Good morning, Cabinet Good morning. Secretary. Um, Yep, um, I was uh, interested in, you had touched on this earlier, Cabinet Secretary, and this was about pilot projects which have taken place in Hamilton, Dundee and uh, Paisley. Um, we've had differing views on the impact of supervised um, bail on the issue of remand. Does the Scottish Government have any specific evidence on that issue? Um, there was, um, with the exception of the valuation, I think there was the, there was the, um, there was the uh, evaluation in 2012 um, of the uh, existing bail arrangements which we have in place. And if I recall correctly from that particular report, uh, there was reference to uh, bail supervision uh, being valuable uh, and assisting, uh, and I think helping to improve how the system was operating. Um, I don't know if the committee are aware of that evaluation report that was carried out. That was evaluating the changes that took place in 2007 uh, and how they were operating. And it came back and demonstrated the existing, existing bail arrangements we have in place are robust, fair uh, uh, and appropriate uh, in how they operate. Um, and part of it made reference to uh, bail supervision programmes uh, and the value that comes from bail supervision programmes. So there has been some evaluation carried out. Uh, and were those the specific Pathfinder projects? Why, why, why were these areas chosen? No, or what? So these were, What's these were, different about them from right. elsewhere, please? These were, these were somewhat different. These were, um, um, uh, th these were informed by the use of improvement methodology. Um, uh, improvement methodology has, by and large, been used within our healthcare setting. Uh, and, uh, for example, our patient safety programme uh, has been developed on that basis. Uh, I was keen to look at whether we could use that type of uh, improvement methodology in aspects of our criminal justice system that could help to drive some change and improvement within it. So we worked in partnership with the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service uh, and with the, the Crown Office to see where we could identify some, uh, a, a, a couple of sheriffdoms where we could test out whether that type of methodology could make a contribution to how our court system is operating, particularly around the use of uh, remand. And these three particular sheriffdoms were identified, by and large because of sheriff principals who were uh, interested and keen to explore um, how this could uh, operate. They operated, in, the three of the pilots operated in slightly different models and a slightly different approach uh, to them as well. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they were designed in partnership at a localised level. Uh, and it, it was to test out whether there were certain measures that could be put in place that would drive change around the use of uh, remand. The results have been very mixed. Uh, and part of that goes back to an answer I was giving earlier on about the consistency element of it, is that it demonstrates there is no real consistency in the use of remand because of the different nature of the cases that are presenting in courts. So trying to say arbitrary levels or specific comparisons proved to be very, very difficult um, in itself. Um, it, it did demonstrate that uh, information being available to sentencers was a... Uh, it was valuable in helping them to understand input from criminal justice social workers was important as well. 
in uh, giving senators confidence in whether they were going to use bail as opposed to uh, remand in certain cases. Uh, so it gave us some important insights, but it, it didn't demonstrate that it would actually make significant change in the system. Uh, and it demonstrated the very uh, the, the significant variations we can have even within an individual court in the course of a day over the use of uh, remand. So it was trying to test out improvement methodology as to where that was a method that could help us in trying to get some level of consistency. Uh, and it demonstrated it was actually very difficult to do just because of the, the nature and the variation of the cases that the courts are dealing with. Okay, thank you very much. Corey? Um, what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that the, there is sustainable funding uh, for the, and effective funding uh, to help the third, third sector se to help the third sector services to be effective? Well, the, we provide um, direct funding to a couple of third sector organisations directly. We shine uh, would be one of them. Uh, Roots out of that. New Roots as well is a is a, we provide direct funding to. The funding for bail supervision and bail information services that are operated by uh, third sector organisations will be provided by uh, local authorities in working in partnership uh, with them. Uh, I, from my perspective, where we can achieve it, uh, uh, prefer to be able to provide third sector organisations with a, a consistency of funding over a couple of years. Uh, that's not always possible, but where it can be, um, uh, I would seek to try and achieve that. It, but the decisions on how funding is arrived at at a local level between third sector organisations and local authorities do appreciate as a matter, as a, a matter for them. Can I ask supplementary to this? Uh, in our discussions, and obviously information gathering, Cabinet Secretary, one of the things that's come through loud and clear is that they find it very difficult to, to budget beyond one year, uh, because obviously mm. the funding comes through from yourselves, the local authority, local authority obviously to them. Um, and in particular, this was very much mentioned to me by SACRO um, in discussions. I had a meeting with them the other day over it, and uh, you know, it concerns me because th they would like to do some really good substantial planning, but doing it for a year is very difficult. I mean, has the government considered maybe looking further for further a longer term? Yeah, look, it has. Uh, part of the challenge has been around the comprehensive spending review. So right. if we don't know what's happening three years down the line, uh, then it's difficult for government to plan. So if we don't know what our budgets are going to look like, mm -hmm. it's difficult to offer others. Where we can we do it? So, for example, the new funding which I announced last week for Victim Support Scotland, mm -hmm. over £13 million, pounds, is over a three-year period in mm -hmm. order to allow them a three-year period to mm -hmm. know what their budget's going to look like, uh, to develop the new homicide service, mm -hmm. uh, a single point of contact, uh, uh, to create a much more victim-centred approach. That three-year funding, where I've been able to do that, I've uh, sought to provide that. But I'm conscious that that's not always possible mm -hmm. um, uh, in certain areas, and I, and I recognise some of the challenges that local authorities have. This is not peculiar to the criminal justice setting, though. It's across the third sector and across the public sector in general, going from annual budgets. Uh, and, I, and I do recognise the challenges of it, but I hope I can illustrate to you, or I have illustrated to you, an example where we can do it. We do try to achieve uh, funding over a couple of years to give them uh, time to plan and to manage their services and to, uh, 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 and to develop their services where we can. Thank you, Cameron Secretary. Yeah. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, following the reforms to community justice made by the Community Justice Scotland Act 2016, the Scottish gov Government has responsibility for the national strategy and the national performance framework. Now, you've mentioned the third sector and this arrangements to Court. use it to support alternatives to, just, uh, to remand. Can I perhaps... Um, read you some of the concerns that um, the committee heard from APEX, for example, that it's been quite difficult because there's an underlying tension between the strategy and the localism agenda, and a vast amount of money is still going through local authority, the local authority figure uh, filter. And more specifically, going back to legislations, where you, you recall there was a little bit of concern if the third sector would be involved um, to the extent that we would all like it to see. Here they say there has been a reduction in third sector involvement in structures across local authorities. The legislation only suggests that they should include the third sector in their decision making and, str and strategic plans. 
Is there something we could look at to firm this up a little bit to make sure they are absolute partners given the very valuable contribution they make? Very clear that third sector organisations play an important part uh, of the mix of services uh, for working with individuals. Uh, and that's why we as a government provide some direct support to them. Um, it, it is, of course, down to individual local authorities to decide on who they have direct partnerships with in the delivery of services at a, uh, at a local level. So uh, I'm, uh, I think there is a danger that if, if you were to put in legislation, that's why the legislation doesn't specify this, is that they must have third sector involvement in it, because it may be in some local authority areas uh, there isn't a third sector organisation who can actually deliver that service for them. It needs to be delivered by a statutory organisation such as the local authority themselves. Um, uh, but it is down to each individual local authority to determine what type of relationship they have with third sector organisation for delivering these services. Can I go back to your first point though, and that was around the issue of funding and the way in which, uh, 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 and the way in which uh, I think it was Apex raised the issue about how funding still goes through local authorities. You may recall, um, although it was my colleague at the time, Paul Wheelhouse, who took the legislation through Parliament, when we uh, brought forward the Criminal Justice Bill, there were those who wanted Criminal Justice Scotland to be the budget holder and to determine how that money should then be distributed at a local level. Uh, and there was very strong opposition to that idea, particularly from our local authorities, in saying, well, why are we creating another body that's now going to control over how, have control over how our money is going to be used? So we agreed that the approach that would be taken is that although there'd be a small amount of money would be retained by uh, uh, Community Justice Scotland, uh, the vast majority of that money would be distributed to local authorities to determine how it should be used uh, within their own local environments. And that was a, a debate that was rehearsed at that particular, uh, particular point. So, I understand and I recognise uh, the point they're making, but it is one it was considered at the time when the legislation was being taken through uh, at Parliament. And, uh, uh, and it is a decision for local authorities to determine which third sector organisations they choose to engage with and on what basis, uh, and uh, for the delivery of whatever services they believe are appropriate at a local level. Um, Notwithstanding that, I do recognise some of the challenges that come for third sector organisations. I saw some fantastic work being carried out by third sector organisations. Uh, and there are some very good, strong relationships between local authorities and third sector organisations that deliver uh, very effective, good quality uh, services. One of the things that I'm keen to ensure we see more of, though, is a sharing of good practice in these areas. So some of the work that uh, Community Justice Scotland are taking forward is looking at how we can much more effectively share that good practice. Uh, where there are good relationships, good services that have been developed and partnerships that are working extremely well, how can we share that with other parts of the country to de demonstrate how, how it operates? Uh, and one of the areas of work that Community Justice Scotland are taking forward is looking at how we can more effectively share that good practice across all our local authority areas. Uh, and that includes the work that they do with the uh, third sector bodies. Um, in terms of legislation, you mentioned where appropriate. So would it, for example, rather than saying only suggest they should include, strengthen that to must where appropriate? Strengthens a bit, but still gives that flexibility. And there's a subtle difference there that does um, make sure, that I think, that local, uh, the third sector would be more involved. And while the funding does go through the local authorities, and of course that gives you an element of localism, with restrained budgets, there is always the temptation that local authorities are going to look at an in-house service, whereas very often it's the third sector that has the flexibility, the experience, and um, the ability to provide a better service, which is value to money, money, be better value for money, but more than that, which has a better outcome for the recipient of that service. I think you recognise that um, yourself, um, Cabinet Secretary, from uh, your previous experience. Well, you will recall, uh, you were a member of the committee that passed the legislation yes. uh, with the existing terms that are within it. So, uh, and these were issues that were considered at the time. Um, I, uh, the legislation has only been in place for a year. Uh, and uh, I'm not minded to start looking at changing the legislation at this stage. Uh, and I'm not convinced, actually, by putting something in legislation that you must do, it will make it happen. Uh, uh, relationships between third sector and local authorities, uh, or any service, 
uh, a better undertaking on a mutually agreed basis rather than a forced basis. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why I think the work that Community Justice Scotland are doing around helping to share good practice and understanding about how these things can operate more effectively and uh, how they're working in some areas and how it could be how that could be translated into other parts of the country, I think is much more valuable than trying to find some sort of life to fix to this. Um, I, uh, this, is, this is not something that requires a life to fix. This is something about uh, culture and approach. And I think if you try to force a local authority into uh, uh, having to undertake a service with a third sector organisation uh, and they don't want to do so, but they're doing it purely because they legally have to do so, I don't think that's a positive, it's going to lead to a positive relationship. Um, so, uh, uh, that good, that shared, sharing of good practice and uh, positive working relationships, I think, is much more valuable than looking for any type of life to fix to deal with it. I merely comment, you're absolutely right. I was a member of that committee that passed legislation and I did labour this at some length, um, as Mr Wheelhouse will probably tell you. So I think it's worth raising again. The third sector is so valuable in so many ways that if they're being disadvantaged or the perception is that they are, then it's most certainly something we'd look at. And I'd ask you again to consider the language in the legislation, which is absolutely crucial. It's not forcing anyone. It's just a shift of emphasis to um, suggesting to must where appropriate. I think that's stronger. But you've given your view, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll, I'll do, just, to, just to be absolutely longer. clear, I've got no intention of revisiting the legislation and I don't believe this is a matter that requires a list to fix. I understand that. Um, but I think the point was worth making. We now move on to John Finney. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, it's been argued that monitor, uh, electronic monitoring uh, should be available as a condition of bail. And I know we'll come on to discuss with that at a future date, but what plans does the Scottish Government have in this area? It has been raised in the course of this. But um, there is obviously, you're about to have a briefing on the, on the bill. One of the provisions that we have um, sought to provide within the bill is uh, uh, powers where ministers could uh, bring forward some potential pilots around the use of electronic monitoring uh, 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 within the area of as an alternative to remand. Uh, I, uh, uh, there has been some practice around this in the past um, that wasn't very effective. Uh, I think there's a variety of reasons as to why it wasn't effective in terms of screening to make sure you're identifying the right type of individuals. Uh, it, was, it would have been radio frequency, electronic monitoring would have been undertaken at that time, whereas part of the Management Offenders Bill will allow us to use GPS monitoring, which is much more effective in terms of knowing where someone is at a given time, etc. Um, uh, so I think it has the potential. And what I'm keen to do is to make sure that we have the legislative powers to be able to test some of this out, uh, to see whether it could add an additional dimension to the range of work that we already have around uh, 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 programmes as alternatives uh, to, uh, to remand. Uh, but we have to do that carefully, uh, because it's not just about providing electronic monitoring, but about other services that have to sit alongside that. Uh, and uh, I, want to, uh, I want to make sure we do that in an appropriate fashion. So, uh, in part of the briefing, I think you'll hear uh, later on, it will set out the, some of the provisions that we're intending to have in the bill, and with the support of Parliament, it will give us the scope to be able to actually test some of this out. And I think the potential now with uh, GPS monitoring is greater than what we had previously with, uh, with the radio frequency uh, electronic monitoring. The only other thing I would say around this is that we have to be cautious of is that we don't simply see it as being used for up tariffing. So someone who at the present time would receive bail, by and large, or someone who would receive bail with the appropriate bail information service or bail supervision provision, anything that uh, we do in electronic monitoring must be over and above that uh, as an alternative to remand. Uh, and that's why I want us to be quite cautious in how we take it forward, uh, because it'd be quite an innovative way for us to, to move around uh, the use of electronic monitoring, but to do it in a way that um, uh, it doesn't simply just fall into it being up tariffing and uh, uh, everyone who gets bill supervision also gets GPS monitored at the same time. Uh, that's not the purpose of what we're trying to achieve here. But I think it has value, but we just need to be cautious in how we take it forward and how we manage that to make sure that it's been targeted and used appropriately. Thank you very much. Ben. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The as you've uh, been hearing from a number of questions from others, uh, the committee has received 
evidence arguing that significant reductions in the use of remand require action beyond the criminal justice system, and we've, we've talked already about the, the third sector and, and local authorities. So I just wanted to, to pick up on, on one specific point. You talked earlier around working across portfolios and sharing good practice and the disruption that's caused to individuals who are remanded in terms of their housing situation. And I wondered how much your department is engaged with the housing minister on that matter, particularly with regard to the new action that's taking place in terms of uh, homelessness and, and rough sleeping. Uh, as a constituency MSP, I've had whether it's con individuals who've been liberated from uh, custody or, or general custody or, or remand, and because a lot of the Edinburgh temporary accommodation is in my constituency, um, coming forward with their concerns, I'd, be, I'd just be interested on your, your thoughts in particular on, on that point. So there was the, um, uh, there was the uh, Offender Reintegration uh, Working Group, which I chaired, uh, which included the uh, Minister for Local Government uh, and Housing, uh, uh, along with other ministers, looking at different portfolio areas and the, uh, uh, and the contribution they can make to helping to reduce reoffending. Uh, and housing is an absolutely key one uh, within that area. Uh, so there's been a fairly extensive work uh, undertaken. That's why we... Um, I think it was at the end of last year, the, the shore uh, guidance was issued uh, around housing provision for those who are leaving custody. A key part of what that's seeking to achieve is a consistency of approach across the country. So we have some local authority areas where there is good engagement takes place, and there's other areas where it doesn't uh, take place well. Uh, and the sure guidelines are specifically to help to achieve a greater consistency and a sustainable approach to uh, providing housing. It's early days in terms of their impact uh, as yet, but that was taken forward by the, uh, the housing minister to try to help address specifically some of the issues about people leaving custody and being able to get access to uh, housing, which goes back to an earlier point I was making about housing being one of the key factors that we know that's important helping to promote desistance and reducing the risk of uh, reoffending. Um, uh, I think that's part which is important in, in terms of the narrative around this. Is it's not about just trying to make sure people who are coming out of prison get a house. It's for about helping to promote public safety because we know if we get them rehoused and settled, the risk of them going back to reoffending is reduced. So it's about that, that virtual circle of trying to help to create communities that are safer. Uh, and housing are an important part. So the short guidelines which were issued last year, end of last year, were specifically taken forward off the back of a reintegration uh, working group work uh, and was led by the housing minister um, as a specific contribution to help to address that. Uh, and we'll uh, hopefully see improvements coming about as a result of those guidelines now being applied right across the country and it will hopefully help to demonstrate greater consistency of approach. But uh, time will obviously uh, tell us how effective that has been Thank you for, for that on that, that specific point. And, um, I also will ask the, the Housing Minister privately with regard to the, uh, the action group that has been put together on temporary accommodation in particular, because I think a lot of the concerns we heard were around that specifically. Um, on the other hand, uh, in terms of victims and families, I just wondered if, uh, as, a, as a final question, if there were any points you wanted to raise in terms of what is being done to ensure that the interests of victims and families are not adversely affected by any measures to reduce the use of remand taking place currently or, or might uh, take place in the future? Well, you know, one of the uh, central requirements for, uh, legislative requirements for the court to consider at a time uh, when it's considering bail is the issue of public safety. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, I can understand there will be, even though they also have to take into account the likelihood of the person's sentence at the end, if they're convicted of uh, the offence, whether they would receive a custodial uh, 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 sentence. Um, I can understand there will be circumstances where uh, sentencers would wish uh, uh, to have the person remanded um, uh, for the purposes of protecting the victim uh, or the... Uh, or witnesses, and I fully support and recognise that. That's why I'm not in favour of the idea that you have carve-outs and say that uh, uh, you can't have remand for these types of cases. I think the court uh, says half the flexibility uh, in considering individual circumstances, including potential victims and witnesses issues um, as, uh, as well. So, uh, so it's balanced and they have to give uh, regard to uh, public safety and there is a public uh, uh, interest element that has to be considered in making any decisions about uh, bail. There are some particular exemptions uh, in exceptional circumstances 
Uh, so, for example, in offences which will be considered in a, uh, on a, a solemn basis uh, relating to um, uh, it would be serious violent offences, sexual offences, uh, drug offences, uh, where uh, uh, there are exceptions in that uh, they should be looking to remand these individuals. Uh, and the court then has to be satisfied if they are not going to remand them. Uh, it changes the balance from the presumption in favour to one actually opposed to, that they have to then give uh, proper consideration uh, to a number of factors in deciding if they are not going to remand individuals who have... Uh, who have uh, uh, been, uh, uh, been considered for particular types of offences. We have just added to that domestic abuse. Uh, so the new domestic abuse uh, bill, which we passed in Parliament um, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, adds to that domestic abuse cases, uh, where, which is an exception where they should be considering remand uh, and circumstances have to be taken into account in determining whether they are going to allow bail. Um, uh, and a key part of that is public safety. <coughs> Uh, within that test. So, uh, so the balances, I believe, are the right balances that we have at the present moment, um, uh, alongside the exceptions. And the evaluation in 2012 demonstrated that, uh, by and large, that we've, it's robust, it's effective. Uh, and the other part is that it also tightened up uh, uh, how we deal with uh, breaches of bail uh, in the actions that the courts can take where there's a breach of bail as well. So, uh, so hopefully that provides reassurance in terms of the balances that we have within the existing system. And I should just make the point that I do think that electronic monitoring is also a method that can help to provide greater assurance to uh, victims in certain circumstances with certain types of individuals if they are going to be given bail, uh, that it could actually be one of the conditions that are attached to it that could provide some, uh, 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 some assurance. And some of the pilot work that I'm considering uh, should Parliament approve this legislation, uh, we'll consider where there are some of the pilots, where some of the pilots can be in some of those areas where witnesses maybe or victims may be particularly vulnerable uh, to see whether electronic monitoring could provide greater assurance, particularly around domestic abuse cases. That's one of the things that um, um, I've already given consideration to and would like to explore um, as one of the potential pilots should the bill be approved by Parliament. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes our question. Can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and your officials for attending? And I suspend briefly um, for five minutes to allow the Cabinet Secretary to leave and for a comfort break.
We're not at five minutes yet. Agenda item four is an evidence session with the Scottish Government Bill Team for the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, which is a spice briefing on the bill, and paper five, which is a private paper. And welcome to the committee, Neil Devlin. Devlin, uh, Bill Team Leader, Community Justice Division, Nigel Graham, Policy Advisor, Criminal Justice Division, and Craig McGuffey. Principal Legal Officer, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. And Neil, you're going to give us an overview of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to provide you with evidence this morning. The Management of Offenders Bill brings forward a number of reforms designed to deliver on the Scottish Government's commitment to continue reducing reoffending, ensuring that Scotland's justice retains its focus on prevention and rehabilitation whilst enhancing support for victims. The substantive provisions of the bill are contained in three parts. Part one expands and streamlines the use of electronic monitoring. Part two modernises and improves the provisions of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974. And part three delivers some of the aims of the Parole Board programme reform to clarify the role of the Parole Board. The expansion of electronic monitoring supports the broader community justice policies of preventing and reducing reoffending by increasing the options available to manage and monitor inter I'm sorry to manage and monitor individuals in the community and to further protect public safety. The EM provisions of the bill are designed to provide an overarching set of principles for the imposition of electronic monitoring. The bill provides clarity as to when and how electronic monitoring can be imposed by the courts in relation to criminal proceedings or by Scottish ministers in relation to release on licence from detention or imprisonment. The bill also creates a standard set of obligations which clearly describe what is required of an individual who is subject to monitoring. The bill also empowers ministers to make regulations to specify the types of devices that can be used for the purposes of monitoring. The introduction of new technologies, such as global positioning system technology, may present opportunities to improve the effectiveness of monitoring, for example, through the use of exclusion zones, which could offer victims significant reassurance and respite. The Rehabilitation of Offenders Act reforms will reduce the length of time most people with convictions have to disclose their offending history, bring more people within the scope of the protections not to disclose, and make the regime more transparent and easier to understand. The provisions in this part of the bill are designed to achieve a more appropriate balance between, on one hand, the rights of people not to disclose their previous offending and thus move on with their lives, with, on the other hand, the need to ensure that the rights of the public to be protected can be effectively maintained. These progressive reforms will help unlock untapped potential in Scotland's people, helping them move on more quickly from their offending behaviour and to assist the economy, improve their life chances and help reduce reoffending rates. Finally, the Parole Board reforms deliver on the Scottish Government's commitment to improve the re effective rehabilitation and re reintegration of people who have committed offences and complete the implementation of the Parole Board reform project to modernise and improve support of the vital wor work of the Parole Board. The measures contained in this part of the Bill aim to simplify and modernise processes and support consistency of approach in relation to parole matters. The specific provisions amend the tenure of board members to bring them in line with other tribunals, reinforce the independence of the board and provide for the administrative and accountability arrangements of the board to be set out in secondary legislation. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
The 2016 report of the Working Group on Electronic Morning, uh, Monitoring included a range of recommendations. Now, a number of these are in the bill itself, but in terms of the recommendations that aren't in the bill, could you tell me what the Scottish Government is doing along with stakeholders to implement these recommendations? Who'd like to take that? Neil? Thank you. Yeah. Um, as you say, there are a number of recommendations contained within the expert working group which aren't uh, in the legislation. Um, some of those uh, provision is made for to maybe be brought forward in the future. Um, the intention of the bill is to provide uh, an overarching framework which lays the groundwork for the future use of electronic monitoring. Um, one of the provisions which is in the bill is to allow Scottish ministers to bring forward regulations that would extend the ways in which electronic monitoring are currently used or are laid down in the bill. That would allow us in the future to bring forward alternative means not currently made provision for. So if the provisions are brought forward, then that would allow a later point in time for those measures which were suggested by the working group, which are not necessarily included to be brought forward as well. Equally, there are a number of recommendations which didn't require legislation for them to be brought into effect. They can be done in um, collaboration, I'm sorry, with SBS or with local authorities, and, and that work is being taken forward by the government, but that falls out with the specific provisions of the bill. Are there any aspects that the government doesn't tend to, to take forward from the recommendation? I, th I think it's fair to say that we fully support the, the basic ethos of the recommendations of the report, which are that electronic monitoring could be used more creatively and more effectively. Um, the report uh, is disappointed, I think it's fair to say, that the current way in which electronic monitoring is used is purely restricted to RF monitoring of a curfew. Um, and the report definitely suggests that there are better ways in which electronic monitoring could be better embedded mm -hmm. in the support which is provided to individuals and that it doesn't work as a standalone service but should be more integrated. And that is definitely something that we've tried to carry forward in the underlying principles of the legislation. I don't think there are any specific recommendations that I could point to and say we definitely don't think that that is worth taking forward at all. Um, but certainly the ones that are currently in the bill as drafted are the ones that we think have the most ability to have the most Im immediate impact. Okay, thank you for that. John Finney. Uh, thank you, Gavina. Uh, good morning, uh, panel, um, uh, and thanks for your input there. W one of the things um, that the Working Group report did highlight was concerns over geographical variations in the use of electronic <laughs> monitoring. Um, can you advise us how these have been addressed, please? I, I think, uh, to a certain extent, that question uh, is beyond the, the capabilities of this bill to address it. Um, I recognise that there is uh, uh, ongoing CERN raised in a number of the um, calls for evidence responses that have been provided to the committee uh, about uh, difference in geographical provision. Um, certainly in terms of the technology, the, the, the current RF technology could be used anywhere by and large, and GPS technology is um, improving all the time and therefore also could be used um, around the country. Um, I think that um, within the bill itself, what we're trying to do is create a system that could be used anywhere and which has equality of impact. Um, but I'm, I'm aware that there are uh, other measures that need to be taken forward to ensure that that happens. Okay, uh, if I may, is, uh, would you consider it future-proofed, which that much used term, in terms of the technology? I, I think the, the aim behind the bill is to ensure that we are not in any way restricted in the ways in which technology can be deployed. Um, so we fully intend to continue using the RF technology, which is currently available, because that's proven to be useful and has a, a very definite place. Um, the powers enabled, the enabling powers within the bill to allow Scottish ministers to specify new devices is envisaged to meet that specific issue that if in the future technology comes along which is better or which can be more usefully served, that then we can then start to use that and we're not restricted to the technology which is available in 2018. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Liam MacArthur. 
just before going into the questions I was uh, planning to ask, just to follow up on John Finney's line of questioning, I mean, as well as future-proofing um, the, the other uh, sort of expression that's entered into political lexicon of late is, is island-proofing. And, and one of the issues around radio frequency tagging in the past has been te technological issues in, in remoter parts of the, the country. Also, possibly a reluctance in some uh, sheriffs or, or, or judges to allow release um, given concerns about, for example, in different islands that, that there won't be a, a police presence and therefore the, 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 the response time to any issue is likely to be longer. Is, is there been consideration in the context of this bill to issues that arise, as I say, not just in an island setting but perhaps more pronounced in an island setting where it's partly about the technology but it's also partly about um, giving public safety that, um, that, that the operation of a, a GPS system um, can be, uh, uh, can be en enabled without um, uh, giving rise to, to, to unacceptable risks. I, I think that um, certainly public protection is one of the things which is uh, at the heart of the legislation. Um, the, the idea behind the expansion of electronic monitoring is to enable a, a greater range of sentencing disposals whilst at the same time ensuring that public protection is taken into consideration. I think in terms of the technology itself, um, the committee may be aware that um, recently the Scottish Government um, released a prior information notice in relation to our intention to issue a new contract. Um, the current contract with the service provider runs until the end of March 2020, at which point we'll be needing uh, a new contract to take us forward. And the, the type of information that we'll be looking for to be put into the new contract also relates to the ability of the technology to work in remoter areas to ensure that it's fit for purpose and that it addresses the particular di difficulties of island and remote communities. Okay, thank you very much. Just looking through the financial memorandum, I mean, it, it would appear to be the case that the expectation certainly in the initial stages in the shorter term is, is no great expansion in the, the use of electronic monitoring, rather the, the shift from radio frequency to, to GPS monitoring. Could you maybe um, set out for the committee what those expectations are in terms of, of level of usage and, and the kind of time frames that are envisaged, say, first three, five years of, of the new provisions being brought into force? I think, um, to begin with, I have to, to put my hands up and say, to a certain extent, we don't know. Um, one of the difficulties that we had when putting together the financial memorandum is that, obviously, at the end of the day, the increase or, if the case may be not increase, will be restricted to the amount of which sentence and other decision makers make use of these new provisions. Um, I think it, it's fair to say that in the short term, we anticipate that there will be a shift from the current position, which is that in order to monitor somebody who is subject to a CPO, you also have to have uh, an RLO at the same time. Um, the uh, intention is that the bill provides sentence makers with the ability to monitor somebody on a CPO without the need for a concurrent RLO. Um, the information that we have from our contract provider is that that amounts to about a thousand cases per year and we would anticipate that that shift in the increased use of CPO monitoring will be offset by a decrease in the use of standalone RLOs. The um, financial memorandum gives anticipated costs based on uh, a rough 10% increase uh, across the different forms in which monitoring can be used. We think that's a, a realistic estimate in the first instance of, of what an increase might look like. Um, but again, it's, it's very dependent on what decisions sentencing makers make of them. Um, we're also aware of the fact that there will need to be a lead in time between the introduction of the bill and the introduction of new technologies. Um, so, to a certain extent, we're hampered in any estimations we can make about how much uptake will be made of it until it actually starts to happen. I mean, obviously, they're, they're not seen or it's not envisaged that they will operate in, in isolation. And in many instances, they will, they will run alongside and be um, supportive of efforts to uh, assist and support um, those to which they're applied. I, again, is there 
uh, is there any sort of clarity you can provide around the estimated costs of those sorts of support measure, measures that will sit alongside the electronic monitoring? I, I think to a certain extent that's a slightly difficult question to answer. Um, the, the intention of the bill is to try and ensure that rather than being seen as a standalone service which is provided out with the regular criminal justice social work system that electronic monitoring should be moved more wholly into the ethos of person-centred um, disposals and tailored disposals. Um, that work is already happening. So individuals who are subject to a CPR are already receiving support from local authorities. And, and the idea is that electronic monitoring is another tool which is provided to enable people to work with those individuals to help them rehabilitate. The bulk of the costs associated with the electronic monitoring part of that will be covered in the contract that the Scottish Government has with the service provider. So whilst we recognise that there will be a certain increase in the, the work carried out by local authorities, to a certain extent that's already captured within the, the work that they're carrying out. Would, is the expectation that um, the way in which the GPS monitoring would work could allow savings to be made in the, in the way that the other measures applied, whether they're, they're um, applied through local authorities or, or in contract through third sector parties? I mean, is that, is that something that's been built into the assumptions that, that are being made? Or? It's not built into the figures that are currently provided in the financial memorandum. Um, the intention is that the extension of electronic monitoring should allow there to be savings throughout the justice system as a whole. Um, but where those savings are realised isn't necessarily going to be in the same place as the outlay is. Um, but is that not, is, in the sense, is that not slightly problematic? Because we could see savings being made that um, are actually being made by organisations that could very well do with that that money being um, reinvested and allowing them to do the other things that will help make a success of the, the system overall. But if, if if they're then being sort of clawed back or, or, or um, benefiting other parts of the system, then we're not necessarily going to end up with a uh, with an overall setup that's delivering the outcomes we want to see. I think that is a difficulty. I think there is always going to be a tension between the different parts of the justice system in the way in which expenditure that is experienced by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and then there are savings further down the line for the Scottish Prison Service. Um, I, I think the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his evidence in the earlier session that the idea behind the, the block criminal justice service funding is that the, there is a, a pot which is made available to local authorities and then it is at local discretion as to how they think that money is best spent. It may be, therefore, that savings which are experienced because of the way in which electronic monitoring has been used can therefore be moved around within the local authority system to allow them to spend money where they wouldn't otherwise have been. But that's something that we'd need to look at further down the line. Because yeah, I mean, otherwise you'd end up possibly with the perverse situation where the local authorities perhaps where electronic monitoring disposals have been used more frequently, freeing up savings that are then deployed in, in, in other parts of the country and, and there may be a legitimate call on, on, on that funding but, but at the same time you're going to have organisations that are operating in that local authority um, area um, that is, is using electronic monitoring extensively. We're saying well um, we're, under, we're under pressure as well and, and, and that funding could, uh, could almost better be uh, deployed here. Is there, uh, there isn't really a way through the bill to, 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 to kind of safeguard against that. That's, I, I think that, that certainly my colleagues uh, in community justice who, who deal with the, the finances would be better placed to um, explain how the, that might be um, guarded against. Um, but I, I don't think that it would be possible within the, the face of the legislation to, to put into place something that would allow that to happen. Okay. Marie Gershaw. Thank you very much. Um, I really have a question in particular about, uh, we've touched on already some of the, the new technologies that might emerge and the powers for ministers within that, just to make sure that we can kind of keep pace with those changes. Um, I really just had a couple of questions. Specifically, first of all, I suppose, in terms of the transdermal alcohol monitoring. I was really curious to find out, I mean, what current conditions would be set by the court, say, at the moment where that would be required? 
and what does that technology uh, essentially involve and how far off do you think that would be from being implemented? Um, if I can answer your second question first, um, which is a slightly odd way to take things. Um, there are a number of different um, alcohol monitoring systems that are currently available. Um, one of which is the transdermal alcohol monitoring, which is a, an ankle bracelet which monitors the level of alcohol in someone's sweat. Um, that's designed to be much like a, a current tag. It's designed to not be removable and uh, it monitors 24-7. Um, there are also a number of uh, essentially breathalyzer kits which are available um, which um, monitor um, at certain points in time um, and um, can either be fixed in a home situation or can be carried around um, and are very much like a, a breathalyzer that um, the police would use. Um, and the data from those can then be sent to the monitoring service. Um, in, in terms of how far off that is, I think that uh, that is probably further along the line than GPS. I think the, the GPS products that are, we're aware of are things that we could bring in very quickly. Um, they're, they're tried and tested. I think in, in terms of the Scottish Government's understanding of how alcohol monitoring would be used within the current legislative setup, I think there's more work that needs to be done before we'd be in a position whereby we could say, yes, we're definitely ready for that. Um, and that is why we're hopefully providing the ability to run pilots, the, as the, the Cabinet Secretary said earlier. We're, we're very definitely not wanting to run before we can walk. So the idea is that we can have um, a, a pilot that would allow us to work out where those type of monitoring devices would best fit within the current legislative system and then if they were successful then roll those out in a, a wider sense um, but I, I, yeah, I think that's, that's not something that's going to be happening uh, as soon as the bill comes into force I, and the initial part of my question as well just about the conditions that are given in the first place that require that the alcohol Craig, monitoring to take place yeah. I can answer that um, I think that the, the ability of the court to impose a, a condition whereby an offender must not um, take, take alcohol, that there's nothing specific in legislation just now, but um, the, the power to make sexual offences protection orders um, and their, their um, replacement the sexual harm prevention orders, um, it's a power to impose a, any conditions, a, a general power to impose, impose conditions on an offender, um, and in theory one of those conditions could be that the offender must not take alcohol. I would say that's possibly less likely than in the custodial setting where a prisoner is released early from prison, whereby um, licensed conditions that regularly have conditions whereby an offender must not take alcohol, whether on, on temporary release or on um, uh, parole. Okay. And I think in, in those situations, that's probably more likely we would see a restriction on um, a prisoner's intake on alcohol. So if, if as Neil was saying, that if, if the Transdermal alcohol, alcohol monitoring is introduced at a later date once technology is ready for it, and we, we take other, um, other, any other legislative, legislative steps we think are necessary. Um, the, the legislation here would allow us to specify devices that monitor uh, transdermal alcohol, and would also allow us to, to add any other court disposals or forms of early release um, to the, the list in here um, that we could attach ultra monitoring to. Okay, thank you. I, in talked about the GPS technology as well and how that might be a bit further away. Uh, but what would be the main benefits of that uh, as opposed to uh, the electronic monitoring and the, the radio frequency that, that's used at the moment? So the, the, the current radio frequency technology... <coughs> I'm sorry. The current radio frequency technology uh, is limited in the, the way in which all it can tell you is whether someone is or isn't present in a particular place. Um, so the... the typical way in which that's currently used is a box is placed within an individual's house. The individual is made subject to a curfew between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. and the, the tag that they wear on their ankle will tell the monitoring system whether they are within that area within those times and if they're not, it'll send an alert. The GPS monitoring system is um, much more... Um, <coughs> wide-ranging in that, as well as being able to say this is a, an area in which you must stay for these certain periods of time, it could also say this is an area in which you couldn't go. 
Um, now, in theory, that is potentially possible with the current system, but that would involve having to have a box in the place where you couldn't go. Um, and the difficulties of that is that if you had to want more than one place, then you'd have to have more than mm -hmm. one box. Whereas with GPS, essentially what you have is a map, and you can draw on that map areas in which you would want to create an exclusion zone. And then if the tag is present within those exclusion zones, it triggers an alert. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just have one further question, and it was about uh, the working group report which recommended extended uh, using extended monitoring as an alternative to remand and obviously remand is something we've been looking at in quite a lot of detail in the committee uh, and obviously the power that Scottish Government ministers will have to expand the list as to what can be covered by electronic monitoring um, however the bill refers to things done in respect of that being in relation to an offender I mean is that something that will be further clarified because obviously if somebody is on remand they haven't been convicted of a crime uh, and will the language around that be made clearer? I think that's, that's something we can sort of look at at stage two. The, the difficulty with, with drafting at the stage was that we weren't the term of art to, to describe person, um, because already in, in, um, in the context of ultra modern we had designated person, um, and in some disposals we also have a, a supervising officer, um, which would be criminal justice social work. So I, th I, th I appreciate the, the problem there, and I think that is something that we can certainly look at at stage two. Okay, thank clarify. you. Rona? Thank you, convener. Morning, panel. Um, I'd like to probe a bit further <coughs> to the disclosure of convictions that you mentioned earlier um, in your opening um, statement. An analysis of responses to the Scottish Government's 2015 consultation paper noted that there were calls for more substantive reforms of disclosure. Um, can you say what they were seeking and to what extent they've been reflected in the proposals set out in the bill thus far? The <coughs> Good morning. Morning. Um, the more <coughs> what they were looking for is when we had the engagement events discussion paper, uh, published discussion paper, there's not anybody with a particular view in terms of what an appropriate disclosure period should be. If you talk to NACRO or Unlock or Recruit with Conviction, Positive Prisons or whatever, some people accept, well, majority accept that disclosure periods currently in the 1974 Act are too long. What they should be is open to question. What the government, Scottish Government is proposing is a balanced approach. Some wanted to go as far as the Home Office-led report in 2002, which was breaking the circle. The recommendations were that all custodial sentences up to life imprisonment, but not including life imprisonment, would have a length of sentence plus two years. There's views that because it only relates to general disclosure, it doesn't have an impact on the high-level disclosure system, there may be a point at which there shouldn't be any disclosure at all. Should you actually disclose a fine for working in an office or working in a garage or working in a shop? Because if you need public protection and have the balance right for public protection, should that really rely on standard disclosure, enhanced disclosure, or to do with regular care with adults or children, the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Act? So there is views that there should be no disclosure at all for basic disclosure. If you talk to the insurance industry, there should be far more disclosure in relating to basic disclosure because they assess risk on the fact that they can only look at unspent convictions. And so then you talk to a whole variety of other people and they sit somewhere in between. When we actually had the engagement events, the initial view was, oh, well, I don't believe you know, that should be this length. And we say, well, how does it affect your, your brother, your son, your daughter, yourself, your husband and wife? Most people wanted to move to have less disclosure, but it's about what can society take at the moment based on the fact that the Rehabilitation Offenders Act in Scotland has never changed, or the disclosure periods haven't changed. So the government's approach is to try and get an appropriate balance based on those who just want no disclosure, less disclosure, and some who want more. And that's the balanced approach the government has tried to adopt in the provisions mm -hmm. in part two of the bill. So just for the record, can you outline what that actually is? You know, what, what are the government proposals then if they're trying to get a balance? If you've got a well, the government proposal is to reduce the disclosure periods. Yeah. So currently, the disclosure period for a fine is five years. So the proposal is to reduce that to one year. Yeah. Admonishment currently is five years. The proposal is to reduce that to zero. Absolute discharge is six months. The proposal is to reduce that to zero. Children's hearings disposal that is only classed as a conviction or a sentence as a special provision with the Act to provide protection is currently six months for a, a discharge 
or 12 months or the length of the order for a compulsory supervision order, both of those will be zero. Reducing the disclosure periods for custodial sentences as well, while increasing the actual scope to 48 months and creating three sentence bans. So you'll have a, a sentence band of zero to 12 months, which will have a length of sentence plus two year buffer period. A sentence over 12 months and up to 30 months will have length of sentence plus four years and a sentence band New, the new sentence band, um, over 30 months and up to 40, 48 months, length of sentence plus six years. And the reason you've got a buffer period of six years there, because the government's proposal is also to make, maintain the current 10 year maximum disclosure period for a sentence that can have a finite period of disclosure. Mm -hmm. And do you think that'll be widely accepted by you know, stakeholders in the community? Well, looking at the evidence you've received so far, majority are supportive of that. Some insurance companies have come back and said, no, Police Scotland are supported of it. Unlock, NACRO and recruitment convictions and positive prisons, what I've read, are supportive of that. The feedback we received from the consultation are, would be supportive of that because we've based it on those consultations, we've based it on letters that I've received over the last number of years from individuals, from MSPs um, on behalf of the constituents and from Scottish MPs as well, and for the types of questions that have been asked in uh, PQs over the years as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a balanced approach. We always have somebody who want more, who want less. Mm -hmm. But remember, this is the system of basic disclosure. This is not the system to do with higher level disclosure where you've got standard enhanced or the Protection of Unruh Groups Act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Anyone else want to? Thank you. Uh, uh, a supplementary, yes, please. Thanks very much. Just on the, on the basis of the, the, the conclusions reached through that consultation, I mean, it, it does seem to mir mirror um, relatively closely, though, with, with a few exceptions, the, the approach that's recently been taken in England and Wales. Was that, was that a factor? Was, were those that you were speaking to um, looking to the, the whatever consultation processes went the, through the, there? The view well? was at least equivalent to right. England and Wales because of the cross-border movement in terms of employment, people moving and travelling, and also companies that may have um, employees that work in Scotland, employees that work in, um, down in England and Wales as well. So we looked at that, and that was part of the consideration. We've also got to look at what is the condition in Scotland and what is the Scottish Government's view in terms of taking forward um, disclosure. The system of high-level disclosure in Scotland as well is more progressive than in England and Wales. So it's basically looking at conditions, what's the current policy in terms of that, and also trying to understand where does each disposal fit, and I suppose in the, the spectrum of what's the seriousness of that particular type of disposal, like, you know, life sentences over here. So that's, you know, so that's, you know, compared to a police warning. So how do you fit all of those disposals in together to have some meaning? Because there's not such a thing as a, an optimum disclosure curve. We can actually put a line down and say, well, if you have that disclosure there, that will reduce reoffending by this or do that. It's about trying to measure, look at what's happening in England and Wales. That's one. Look at what the feedback's received. Listen to the, the conversations we had in the engagement events as part of that discussion paper and trying to come to some balance um, that would be appropriate, that reduces disclosure, allows people to move forward and also still allows employers to have information at a particular point in order to make um, um, employment decisions for those general disclosure purposes. So I think it's a, you know, in terms of what the government's doing, it's trying to get that balanced approach. I, I suppose that point you made at the outset about the interaction between those that are moving back and forth across the borders and, and, and businesses, for example, that, that want to have a degree of consistency uh, across the, the, uh, the, the country, it, it would, I suppose, suggest that the process that has been gone through in England and Wales was, was one into which Scottish ministers and officials and, and the wider stakeholders would have wanted to feed into as well. Was that, in fact, the case? It's, it's certainly a, an aspect in terms of how things have worked. I mean, the UK government looked at the Home Office-led report as well in terms of breaking the circle, and that's about trying to match the custodial sentence length more to disclosure periods. So that's why you're having sentence bans plus a buffer period. So that matches disclosure more appropriately with that. So they looked at that, so we looked at that, and also looked at what, what were the recommendations of breaking the circle. That seemed appropriate. Also, the evidence we received from the consultation paper, responses to the discussion, discussion paper and the engagement events also gave us that information that it would be better to be more aligned. 
Whether you get it perfect or whether you could ever get a perfect system, it's open to question, but it's trying to get that right balance that feels appropriate, and that's what we've done. So it's about considering all aspects of that. I mean, you could quite easily say, well, we'll just copy what they've done in England and Wales and just... Or you actually do investigate and you listen to what people say and you actually look at all the reports and the evidence. And what we did as well is go right back to 1974, 1972 and look at the Gardner Committee report, which actually set up the Rehabilitation Offenders Act and said, what were the founding principles behind that act, i.e. it should be based on sentence? Well, is that something that's still consistent in terms of new research? Well, Breaking the Circle still said it should be based on sentence. The UK government said it's based on sentence. The evidence we received from the discussion paper consultation, it's imperfect, but yes, it still be based on sense because it's an easier way to consider disclosure and also the courts, when making a determination of sentence, can consider all the information available, culpability, the seriousness of the offence, you know, the person's previous you know, convictions as, as well. So in all of those instances, we're just making a determination of whether a sentence should determine a disposal. You're, not, you're looking at a lot of different factors in order to come to that conclusion. And the Scottish Government's conclusion was it's still appropriate. Thank you. OK, Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Rita. Good, good afternoon, panel. Um, in relation to the armed forces, the bill doesn't uh, propose any changes to disclosure periods for sentences imposed under the legislation. Mm, that's right. What's the reason for this? It's reserved. Ah, thank you. That answers it. <laughs> And you have another question, Maurice? Yes, yeah, sorry. It's the next one, yeah. Um, one of the aims of the bill, um, panel, is, is to make the rules of disclosure easier to understand. To what extent will the changes set out in the bill achieve this? And could more be done to simplify the system, for example? Well, certainly, the government, I'm sure, will be open to any um, proposals to try and improve that. Certainly, in terms of accessibility, what has been done is remove redundant provisions. And the key thing that, that people asked, the stakeholders asked, was to actually change Section 5 and Section 6. Mm -hmm. Section 5 is where the disclosure periods are set out, mm -hmm. and Section 6 are the rules around when someone gets more than one conviction. So we've removed all the redundant provisions and we've set out clearly and accessibly exactly what the disposal will be. So it's a fine, but on table A, 12 months or six months if you're under 12, clearly set that through. So it should be easy for anybody to go to section five, have a look at that. This is, I got a CPO, what will that be? It'll be the length of order, it'll be 12 months or the length of the order. Mm -hmm. And work your way through. Now, because we were, one of the provisions as well was to deal with the way <coughs> section one one is constructed to do with excluded sentence rule, i.e. if you get a sentence, say a fine at the moment, and before the disclosure piece ends, you get a excluded sentence, i.e. at the moment a sentence over over 30 months, then both will be disclosed forever. We didn't think that was right. We thought excluded sentences should be out with the rules within the Rehabilitation Offenders Act. So if you get an excluded sentence, you know you'll always have to disclose that. You may, as a consequence of getting subsequent sentences later on, eventually get a excluded sentence. For example, if you get a consecutive custodial sentence, the sheriff turns around and says, I, you know, I'm going to sentence you two years and, or, and three years to run consecutively. Consecutive sentences are added together. Mm -hmm. So two plus three equals five, which is greater than 48 months. So therefore, that will be a, an excluded sentence. So there's still the possibility of getting a further excluded sentence, but it should impact on the rules. Now, we appreciate Section 6 is probably one of the most difficult sections to try and work out. But because we changed some of the definitions, changed the excluded sentence rules, we were able to mm -hmm. actually change the language to section 6.1, section 6.2, section 6.4, 6 and 6.5 and 6.6 to update it, which will make those um, rules easy to understand. But part of that will also be publishing guidance in the Scottish Government webpage um, to actually explain how these rules work more effectively. Right, okay, thank you very much for that, Trina. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Morning. The, you mentioned terminology there, Mr Graham. Yeah. Uh, in the policy memorandum, it uh, notes that the, the rules on disclosure are not intended to suggest that a person who has unspent convictions is always unsuitable for employment. And uh, specifically, it changes some of the terminology to uh, hopefully clarify that for employers. Is there anything else that's being done to clarify that for employers going forward? 
Well, certainly, the Cabinet Secretary is clear that changing the law itself is not enough. The community, I work in criminal, criminal justice, but there's also community justice, new works. There's a lot of work going on with employers, I think there's employer support network in terms of trying to develop understanding around why employers may have an unconscious bias around thinking I shouldn't employ someone who has got an unspent conviction. It may be down to the fact that the person is not rehabilitated or deemed not rehabilitated. I mean, there's organisations like Virgin, you know, BT, there is um, Marriott's Hotels that are very positive about employing people with convictions and recognise the fact that just to bar an individual because they've got an unspent conviction or even a, a spent conviction for a high level disclosure isn't necessarily good for them because they're cutting off their employment pool. So there's work in terms of uh, community justice to discuss with employers. I'm in discussion with organisations like Recruit with Conviction, Positive Prisons, and how best can we discuss with employers in order for them to take an approach and say, well, surely it's best to have a dialogue with someone. Surely it's best that the person who may have that conviction may actually be the best person for the job, may have all the skills but are you just going to ignore them? So it's the legislative change to try and change that language, as I say, to, get, to re remove that unconscious bias that lots of people have, may not even realise they've got an unconscious bias. We sit here and we're immersed in justice issues, but if you're working in a, a small business and you see this person is not rehabilitated, well, I don't want to employ that person that's not rehabilitated, so maybe they'll just ignore them. So changing the language to say it's just about disclosure. There's nothing in the Act that prevents anybody from, have that, from having a job under the Rehabilitation Offenders Act. So it's about the opportunity, it's about disclosure, disclosure for a period of time, and then if it's still unspent, you can have that dialogue. So it's, it's work within the community justice, with employers, as well as changing the law. I understand. The, um, in terms of the disclosure, uh, and you talked earlier, Mr Graham, about the, the higher level. So you talked about the basic disclosure, mm -hmm. and then there were three other categories yep. uh, which require uh, more disclosure. Uh, this bill doesn't no. seek to change any of those higher level disclosures. That's right. Um, but the committee understands that uh, the Scottish Government is consulting on possible changes to the higher level disclosures. Can you give us any more details on that? They'll be consulting on it shortly. Uh, with and that'll be on disclosure and it will be on PVG. And what's their interest there? Well, it's, I suppose the, I'm not a spokesperson for the PVG Act or for the higher level disclosure system there. And obviously I'm conscious about the consultation paper hasn't been published yet. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm limited to be able to, you know, to, to talk about that really. The key thing, they'll be asking questions around how the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Act works and the number of disclosures that are available around that. Looking at standard disclosure, enhanced disclosure, what does that actually mean? Standard disclosure spent and unspent convictions and enhanced disclosure spent and unspent convictions but also as part of part five of the Police Act. The police are allowed to um, prov provide other relevant information around that as well. So that could be non-conviction information, soft information around that as well, which is different then from the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Act, which would be a member of the you know, uh, vetting and barring scheme. And then if you're part of that, then you could be mon you're monitored for your life in terms of being part of that scheme. And that would be to do with <coughs> regulated work with children, regulated to work with adults. And it's a question around what does that mean? So it's trying to look at that whole system of high level disclosures, recognises that as a result of changes to that system because of case law, Supreme Court have ruled that, there's been changes to that system of high level disclosure, bring that together, asking certain questions in order then maybe to take forward legislation in the future around that. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the difficulty in, in, in being clear, so I'll, I'll phrase the question, we'll see if we can get uh, an answer. Well, do I, I am limited to talk about certain other policy that's out this bill when the consultation paper that. hasn't been hasn't been, um, and I don't want to get, really get into details, but that's not but my But do you have any sense of the current thinking uh, of the government? The does current the, thinking in, does it feel by the working? courts is less disclosure. Less disclosure yeah. on, on the higher level checks. Yeah. Thank you. And that's what's happened. Understand. Thank you, yes. convener. I think we just got there and no more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Daniel. Yeah, so I was really wanting to ask some questions regarding the changes to the, the parole board. At, and I guess at the outset, I mean, I'd be very conscious that as you were preparing this, the, the whole war boys uh, uh, 
situation really came into sharp public focus uh, in England. And I was just wondering to what extent that uh, there was any reflection on that or what your view is or that, you know, the, the, the lessons that may be gleaned and, and, and whether or not, to what extent you feel these changes address those and to what extent there are maybe you know, possible changes that, that, that are out with the scope of what you can do with the legislation that we have in front of us or the bill that we have in front of us. I think it's fair to say that the, the changes that are proposed by the bill have been in train for some time mm -hmm. and as such, um, they, they have been in gestation for a while and they're designed to address specific difficulties that had already been um, identified. Um, I think in, in terms of the specific issues raised by the War Boys case, it's probably important to say that there are distinct differences between the way in which the Parole Board for Scotland operates and the way in which the Parole Board in England and Wales operates. But certainly, if there were any additional issues that were identified during the course of your investigations into the Parole Board, then I, I don't think there would be any reason why we would be, we would be against the idea of, of seeing if there were other difficulties that we could address whilst we have this legislative vehicle available to us. So, so I, mean, I think if there was one you know, lesson uh, to be drawn from, from, from that case um, is that it was a really about kind of the public perception um, a, 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 as against how the, the, the Pro Board uh, in England uh, operates, certainly within that particular case. So in, in terms of the tests, and that is one change that is being implemented, uh, indeed the Pro Board themselves have made a submission and have suggested that, that perhaps greater clarity um, uh, with regard to what tests are applied you, you, you know, that, that, that is one area that, where this uh, bill could be improved. I was just wondering if, if that's something that, 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 that you have uh, reflected on and what your reaction to that uh, suggestion is. I, I think part of the, the difficulty in relation to, to this is it, it's difficult to identify what a common test might look like. I, I don't think that there is um, at large a agreed position on what a common test could look like. Um, but I don't think that were such a common test to be identified and, and thinking on that common test were sufficiently far along that there would, wouldn't be a reason why we couldn't look at that. Okay, just finally, I mean, I think the other key point and probably one of the central points in terms of the, the Pro Board submission is regarding uh, its uh, independence. In particular, I think um, the way appointments to the, the, the Pro Board are made. Now, while I understand that, that, that one of the sub substantial points is about changing the composition, I think the point made here is that, that um, greater um, assurances regarding the independence of those appointments could be made and should be made. Indeed, their suggestion is, is that um, perhaps appointments to the Pro Board could be made by the Judicial Appointments Board for Scotland. Uh, again, is that uh, something that was considered? If it, you know, uh, if it was dis dismissed, why was it? Or is it something that might be considered through the course of this bill? Um, I think that there are um, a number of competing demands in, in relation to the way in which the current system works, which involves the um, regulator and the, the way in which appointments might be taken forward in the future. Um, that's something that we're perfectly happy to continue looking at during the course of scrutiny. And uh, if a, an agreeable um, compromise was reached whereby we could identify a way in taking that forward, I think that, that's something that we're happy to look at. Uh, and, and including that specific point about the appointments being made by um the Judicial Appointments Board? I, I think that's something we'd probably need to discuss with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, um, but I'm, I'm more than happy to get back to you on that point. And again, in particular, they, they say that the, um, the Pro Board should be uh, explicitly um, uh, set out as a, a tribunal NDPB. Is that a, 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 a point that you would consider through the course of the bill? I, I think the, the Scottish Government's position is, is that the bill is designed to reinforce the independence of the parole board. Um, we feel that the provisions as currently drafted are sufficiently strong in that, but uh, again, that if during the course of evidence it becomes apparent that that's not necessarily the case, I don't think that's something that we would dismiss out of hand. But certainly our position is that the, the independence of the board is enshrined in the bill as currently drafted. Thank you very much.
If I could just ask one final question on the composition of the parole board. Under the Prisoners' Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act 1993, then the overall membership um, of the parole board must include a high court judge and also a psychiatrist. Why have they been omitted from the composition of the new bill? My understanding is that the position of the board is that there is sufficient current expertise within the breadth of members of the board that the specific requirements um, are no longer necessary um, and that um, going forward our intention is to ensure that there, there is a wide range of different expertise on the board um, but that there are certain administrative difficulties that arise because of the specific inclusions of the requirement to have those specific members that um, can be overcome by the removal of them from the specific legislation. Can you be a bit more specific about what these difficulties were? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't have that information to hand, but it's certainly something that, that I can get back to you on. Uh -huh. Because certainly, including a High Court judge, you know, you're looking at cases that are very, very serious and expertise there. A psychiatrist, too, seems to me, with particular expertise, seems to be a sensible suggestion. So I'd certainly welcome further uh, information. If there are no further questions, that concludes our questioning. And can I thank you all very much for attending. We now move on to item number five, which is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 19th of April. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions. And I refer members to paper six, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney as the convener of the subcommittee to provide feedback. Thank you, Convener. As you say, the, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 19th of a April um, when we took evidence from, on Police Scotland's review of its custody provision. Uh, we took that evidence from Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen, the Criminal Justice Services Division of Police Scotland, Callum Steele, the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, and Lucille Ingalls, Chair of the Police Staff, uh, Staff Scotland branch of Unison Scotland. Uh, now, the subcommittee heard that whilst a number of people were being taken into police custody has been reduced and there have been improvements to Police Scotland's custody provision, there remained a number of custody issues to be resolved. And these included, uh, one, uh, the continued use of police officers to back full vacant police custody and security officers, PCSO posts, some PSOs working alone in custody centres, which is not best practice, and whilst there are to be 70 new staff employed by July, there was doubts about whether this would be sufficient to fully resource the custody centres and that whilst the number of prisoners being transferred long journeys had reduced, it still occurred and this was further exacerbated by an increase in custody processing times. So the subcommittee agreed to keep this issue under review and it also considered its forward work programme and agreed to request information from Police Scotland on its IT. CT strategy. I'm okay, happy thank to you. take any questions. Do members have any questions or comments? Um, I think there were some important things that were raised in the subcommittee that would mitigate and certainly uh, make sure that we did monitor it, the delays in processing and how the new um, RLOs, the restriction delivery apron orders, were working are certainly things we'd want to keep in view. Um, Lee MacArthur? Just on that point, I think that's, that's, that's fair and I think probably also worth reflecting that there was an offer from Callum Steele um, to follow up in, in terms of some of the, 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 the bureaucratic issues that appear to be ar arising out of the, the new forms. Um, and, and so it'll be up for the subcommittee to see how it, it responds to that invitation. But I, I, I think there's, there's certainly an issue there we probably do need to explore in a bit more detail. Right, thank you for that. Uh, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on 1st May when we may take evidence on the proposed integration of the, when we will take evidence on the uh, proposed integration of the British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland. And we now move into private session.